Welcome. I'm Kinetic Symphony. I hunt down and report on mysterious and weird true stories, from glitches to the paranormal. This is my monthly compendium of stories for the month of August 2021. Enjoy. Case file number 202, written by Kanukistani Lad. In an instant, four hours passed. This happened in Winnipeg, Manitoba in the edit late spring, early summer of 1999. I was living in a gritty neighborhood popular with gangs and unemployed artists. At the time, I was more the latter, and I was clean and sober. I went to the neighborhood coffee shop to drink coffee and read and write alone. This was a local shop, not a franchise. Everyone who worked there wore a carved, wooden, Celtic-style knot on a necklace. I thought it was odd, but there are a lot of artisans in the hood so I thought they were maybe all fans of some local craftsperson. I sat down at a table for two, facing the door, a habit I picked up from my dad. The server, wearing one of those Celtic wooden knots, took my order. I glanced up at the wall to my right, and the clock said 1pm. In an instant, I could hear the staff, and some of the other patrons, laughing and looking at me. I felt embarrassed and awed. Altered. I looked at the clock at my right, and it was 5 p.m. Like in Hereditary, when the outdoor shots of the house changed from day to night like someone flipped a switch. I was in the exact same position. I didn't feel as if I moved or as if someone moved me. But I was terrified. I grabbed my book and ran home. I never went back to that place. I still don't know what happened. Edit. A few extra comments about my life at the time. I wasn't isolated, I was plugged into a network of local artists and slackers, but I lived alone and was writing a lot, hours a day, and I was experimenting with the occult a bit, to my regret. Edit 2 Thanks to all of you for your thoughtful replies. This experience is one that has bothered me for literally decades. It's reassuring to know that subs like this exist to give serious thought to these odd experiences and I have an appointment with the doc in the coming weeks. I'll bring this up and search my memory banks to see if I've had similar experiences that I'm suppressing. You guys rock. Case file number 203, written by Lumpy Constellation. Opposite directions they pass. Goodbye. Hmm, what the hell? That's them up ahead. Yesterday, my fiance and I were both 29, went to a lake about 20 minutes from our house. We're very outdoorsy and love a lake day, and we love this lake in particular because we found a great secluded swimming area. You have to hike two miles to get there after parking, so it's often either empty or just adult couples hanging out, sometimes families with older kids. The hike there is one narrow paved road with the mountainside on one side and a steep drop off into a riverbed on the other side, so there's absolutely no way around it and no alternate routes. We also asked the park ranger the first time hiking it, and he confirmed it's the only trail to the swimming area. So yesterday, we park and start walking, and we notice a guy and his two kids exploring the trail a bit, walking back and forth like he's trying to figure out where the lake is. Pretty common occurrence. They were a memorable bunch because the father and son both had bleached sections of hair. Dad had dreads with a few of them bleached, and the son had a bleached mohawk with black hair on the sides. They're walking back in the direction of the parking lot, opposite to the direction we're going, and he asks us where the lake is and I tell him, about two miles ahead. We keep walking and I hear his daughter yell, exacerbated, behind us. Two miles? And they kept going towards the parking lot. We completed the hike and it was very quiet, no other people on the trail that we saw. It would have been pretty difficult to miss others since this is a secluded area. And if someone wanted to pass us, we would have had to stop to let them pass us since the trail is pretty narrow and we had our dog with us. So we get to the lake and set up at a picnic table and I turn to take in the scenery when suddenly I see the same family. They're already set up and the kids are even swimming. It's like they've been there for a while already. I ask my fiance if that's the same family and how they beat us there. He confirms it's the same bunch but also has no idea. The only thing we could think of is if they walked in the riverbed, but we would have heard their voices echo down there and any path down there is completely overgrown with trees and shrubbery, so how would they even hike it? 
And why would they choose to be down there when there's a perfectly good paved trail? And they'd been going in the opposite direction as us when we saw them earlier. Case Notes, file number 203. Well, okay, I just had to comment on this one, because it reminds me of another recent story where the guy was sitting in a bar with his friends. He sees a man pass by. Then the same man passes by again from the same direction seconds later. But that was one man. His friends reacted oddly. In this case, you had multiple witnesses who were as baffled as you were. Is God playing with us? Are we in a simulation with developers having a laugh at our expense? Or was it a glitch in the system? Those people's spirits zipping ahead, perhaps in the same way they did eventually leave. Maybe interacting with another family at that time, the same way you saw them interact with yours. A touch of foresight at a distance. Bonus file, written by A.O. Runes. Dad passed away, ashes scattered, yet he was seen again by a lake months later. So, I have recently been riding my bike around our local park, just about every day that the weather allows. Yesterday, I had the music going and was pedaling away like usual, when I came rolling up to a guy and his dog. He just kind of looked at me and smiled like we knew each other. I nodded and went on my way, but there was something about his face that stuck out. It's just a coincidence, I thought. There was no way. But it looked just like my dad. This wasn't my dad that I saw last summer, not my dad that I remember standing talking in the driveway for the last time. This was my dad's face that I remember in the hospital before he took his last breath. I made another lap around the lake and campground on the other side of the park. I came up to the hill and he was still standing there, almost as if he was waiting on me. He looked at me, waved, and smiled again. He just stood and watched as I was slowly pedaling up the hill. I got to the top and paused for a second, staring at the man through my sunglasses. It felt like I knew him. I looked at him for a second before riding off. It really felt like my dad was standing there. I couldn't bring myself to say anything though, for some reason. I usually pass people several times while riding. I didn't see him again on any path. This was another weird thing that stood out. He was at the top of the hill by the bridge that goes over the river when I first saw him. He was still there when I came back around, but not anywhere along the trails there when I came up around a third time. As a side note, he was cremated and per his wishes, we spread his ashes into that river. My dad always told me stories of how his dad, my grandpa, saw ghosts. My dad never had any ghost stories from his own point of view, well, that I know about. Does anyone have any insight or a similar experience? Bonus file, written by No Name Maddox. A diary to confirm a terrifying memory. I hope this experience fits in here. First time encountering otherworldly entities or spirits. I recall this night so clearly, or so I thought. I am currently reading through all my old diaries, ages 11 to 22, and I came across the night in question. It was in the middle of an entry. For a second, I didn't even know I was reading the same event that touched me so deeply. For context, when I was 12, my mom couldn't find a sitter for a late night meeting, so I had to go with her, along with my younger brother, B, and a friend, Mac. We had to keep ourselves entertained, somehow, in a church at night. Naturally, there's a cemetery in the back we had to fool around in. My entry reads, me, Mac, and B went into the cemetery in the dark. I screamed and hid behind a gravestone to scare B. Then B taught us a ritual that brings the spirits out. You stand on the gravestone and say, May rise, ten times. I stood on about six stones at different times and did it. Then I was standing on one and Mac and B were facing me. Mac saw something walk towards us and then run. I saw a black something that was hunched over going behind a tree. B saw what I saw. Then we were up near the church more and I was staring at one that was right next to a tree. I stared at it for a long time and was shaking a lot and fast. Its head moved the most. Then it waited for me to go over there. I'm not crazy. Mac even saw it too. To clear things up, Mac saw something walk towards us and then run. 
I am standing on a stone, facing B, Mac, the church, and a wooden area to the right of it, where I saw the something. Mac said he saw a tall, robed person standing behind a stone in the back of the cemetery. While she was trying to make out what she was seeing, it appeared a few rows closer. She screamed and pulls me off the grave, falling on my stomach. I looked up to see her and B running towards the church's spotlights, so I followed. I was trying to compute what I thought was a hunched robed person walking behind a tree within the woods next to the church, at the same time they were absorbed in the figure behind me. Our descriptions of the two different things we saw were oddly similar, though theirs sounded tall, around 7 foot, and mine was short, around 5 foot. I was also to the point that I completely forgot about the part where we stood under the light and stared at one of them next to a tree. All three of us stood there in silence for at least five minutes. I remember watching its head rotating around the shoulders, like a pinwheel, so fast it was blurry. Following this experience, I don't recall feeling anything about it. Even my diary entry quickly moves on to another topic. It wasn't until a couple years later when I experienced a similar entity in a cemetery while using a Ouija board with a friend. I felt a dreadful, familiar feeling, one that made me recall the night at the church. On the outside, my skin feels sweaty, like I suddenly got the flu. But on the inside, I'm a dark, hollow carcass, bound to the savageries of the universe. Anyway, I just wanted to share this experience, especially since I found this old diary entry. Case file number 204, written by Oatman Zero. An ominous sound at 4 in the morning. Guys, so at 4 in the morning, I was awakened by this strange sound that seemed to be very peculiar, something that I have never heard before in my life. This sound kept going for around 10 to 12 minutes and was coming straight from the sky. I have recorded it as well as you're hearing now. When this began, I had just woken up, so I was quite taken aback by it and slowly I began to wonder if it was an alien UFO or something like that. But after a few minutes, I began to think reasonably and the only obvious explanation is that it is a drone. I just assumed that it was a drone and calmed down, but all of a sudden, it stopped. All of a sudden, there's no sound at all. I don't think drones are that fast at all. And plus, who uses a drone at literally 4 in the morning? So I'm very confused at what the sound is. Do you guys recognize it? And yes, that screeching noise after every hum is coming from it too. It was coming directly from the sky, but when I looked, I saw nothing in the sky. Please tell me what you think that sound is. Case file number 205, written by ARL1509. Swift like a ninja, they vanished. A little context. I was at an airport waiting to board a plane. I was 19 at the time, and my family and I were taking a trip to Barbados. We were all sitting next to each other in the terminal, waiting to board. I was mostly on my phone, occasionally glancing up. Eventually, I got distracted watching this couple sitting across from us entertaining their toddler with the toy maraca, those tough plastic ones babies always chew up. The strange part came when my phone buzzed with a text from my friends. I only glanced down to see who the text was from for a moment before looking back up, and when I did, the couple and their toddler were gone, including their belongings. I scanned the terminal for them, but I didn't see them anywhere. I mentioned it to my mom at the time, and she also seemed puzzled, but wrote it off as them leaving to board. I don't see how anyone could have left with all their belongings in just a second or two. Case file number 206, written by Becky is here. The key, a purple butterfly. This story starts many years before the main event. Long story short, a butterfly sat on me at my father's funeral, a purple one which we couldn't find in a book afterwards. A similar butterfly sat on a wall by me when I got lost after that. Maybe just coincidence, maybe just ordinary butterflies, but something personal to me that I never spoke about with anyone. Many years later, I had to travel hundreds of miles to the office of a colleague I was doing a project with, and while we were working, his co-worker came in for a few seconds to get something, and we had the standard introduction, this is X, hi, this is Y. I forgot about him. 
About a year after that, my colleague and I were at a conference and he asked me if I remembered his co-worker from the year before. I said, very vaguely, I only met him for 10 seconds. My colleague was really embarrassed about something and told me that his co-worker had now retired and that when he cleared out his desk at work, he had found something in his desk and was absolutely insistent that it be given to that woman who visited you that I met one afternoon. My co-worker then apologized that it was very stupid and handed me a purple plastic butterfly. Just coincidence? You tell me. Case file number 207, written by Delta Anonymous. A plane on fire that was never heard of or reported on again. A few years back, my best friend and I were heading downtown via highway from the suburbs to a hockey game. It was about 4 p.m., sun shining, no clouds, blue sky. A normal afternoon traffic as this was during the middle of the week. We both see a plane up ahead and to our left, fairly high up, but noticeably a commercial airliner. You could see flames on the right side of the plane and it was trailing black smoke. We had just left the suburbs, so there's no major airport nearby. About 40 plus minutes straight south driving time to the nearest one. The plane was flying east but we were too far north for it to be circling to legitimately land at the usual airports. Both my friend and I kept track of it for about 5 minutes down the highway, at 70 miles per hour. The highway does not get blocked by trees, a barrier, buildings or anything. We had an easy time seeing it. I looked online to see if any reports had shown up about it. Nothing. We had to slow down suddenly from traffic, so we both looked forward. Then before we got going again, we looked right back where the plane should have been, and it was gone. Nothing there. Again, there was nothing for it to disappear behind. It was moving at a normal airliner pace, never changing direction. It was just gone. My friend and I didn't know what to make of it. I checked for any reports of downed planes over the next few days, and found nothing. Legitimately, it's like it never happened. It's just crazy. I could clearly see flames and smoke. I do know that commercial airlines can look like tubes or blimps with the right reflection or refraction of light, as if the wings aren't there. Or with the right reflection, they can look just like a ball of light and may disappear. I had spent the next 15 minutes of the ride looking for it before we would be too far. Never saw it again, no smoke trail or anything, no reappearance due to shifting light, just nothing anywhere. I don't get it. If you're enjoying this video, consider giving it a like. Now on to the next story. Bonus file, written by Aurelion. It was fast, it was furry, it had unbelievable eyes. I absolutely want to make it clear that this is true. My wife and I both witnessed this and will never forget what we saw last night. I am a 43 year old man, a former marine with a lot of time at sea and a former railroader. So I've been to a lot of places that are just hard to get to for most folk. I have never seen anything like what we saw last night, and it happened on Highway 50 in between Penrose and Pueblo, Colorado. My wife was working a closing shift in Cannon City last night. I left Pueblo and made the drive west as usual. After she clocked out, we went to pick up our son from his job, only to find he wasn't working last night. On the drive back from Cannon, you pass Penrose, and then there's a place I have always called the Big Hole. The Big Hole is actually called Pierce Gulch. There is a significant drop in elevation, and then you immediately climb back out, hence my nickname. As we were approaching the Big Hole, at about 12.40 AM, something, traveling from north to south, crossed all four lanes and median of Highway 50 at an incredible rate of speed. We were the only vehicle out there at this time of night, and we nearly hit it. It was roughly three feet tall and had long brown hair everywhere. And again, this thing was hauling ass, faster than any animal I have ever seen or heard of. My wife was driving and had our son on speakerphone. She startled and looked at me and asked, What the hell was that? By this time, we were down in the bottom of the gulch and headed back up the hill. We told our son what we saw and my wife got off the call. We discussed it for a second and decided to go back and see if maybe it had gotten caught in the barbed wire fence or something. Maybe there was some trace of this thing. We both were amazed by how fast it was moving. 
By 1245, we had traveled back to the west side of the gulch and turned around. There wasn't any traffic, so my wife just slowly rolled down the shoulder of the highway, and I had my window down and was shining a flashlight that I had in the car out into the field. There isn't much out there except cactus and stuff. As we came up to the approximate area we saw this thing, I told my wife, Hey, look, do you see those eyes? She said yes and stopped the car. Ten yards or so on the other side of the fence was a pair of very bright, very blue eyes, not far off the ground. I was thinking we probably were looking at a coyote or something. It was looking directly back at us. What happened next, I will never forget as long as I live. Whatever those eyes belonged to, freaking stood up like a man, like a six and a half foot to seven foot man. They were still looking at us. Whatever it was that flew across the road at like Mach 2, this was it. This was the hairy thing we saw. There was a moment of disbelief and shock, and then as it registered, that we found the thing and it wasn't just some animal, the fear kicked in. I told my wife, go, 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 freaking go. It seemed like slow motion. She floored the gas and the thing watched us leave. We already knew that the thing was incredibly fast. So she drove as fast as she could and out of the gulch and I was looking at the back window and checking mirrors. My wife was afraid it might be following us. It wasn't and I didn't want to make things worse by admitting that I was worried too. We drove very fast for several minutes. We talked, but it was almost like we were just talking to ourselves, like, oh my freaking god, what the hell was that? And was it waiting for us? Soon the lights from Pueblo West were ahead, and we were back in civilization. Once we got into the city, we finally started to relax a little. We talked until we got home and then checked the car for anything. We couldn't really go to sleep for hours. My wife got online and was searching for anything that matched the creature we saw. She found some stories, paranormal in nature, of other people witnessing a creature that sounded exactly like the one we had seen. She has to work the same shift tonight. So on our way to Cannon City, we're going to stop and go out into the field where we saw that thing and see if there's any evidence, footprints or hair, something. Case file number 208. Written by Fat Girl 2292. That building we passed every day morphed. It might sound stupid, but when I got to work, I always pick up a friend that works in the same place I do. And we pass through the street that has some apartment buildings with yellow paint and they have a black gate. Every single day we pass through there, my friend tells me, Damn, I wish I could afford an apartment there. Since they're really nice looking but we heard they are very expensive, out of our budgets. So anyways, yesterday, I picked up my friend on our way and as we're getting close to the apartment complex, I'm already thinking, here we go again. My friend is gonna start telling me how she wishes she could live there, like she always does every day. I'm concentrating on the road when I hear my friend say, what the hell? I looked at her, mouth was open and she's pale. I turn around to where the apartments are supposed to be, and it's a whole different apartment complex. Different colors, some are beige colored and no black gate in front and even the name is different. These ones are called Sunset Apartments, but the yellow ones with the black gate we see every day are called Alta Vista Apartments. I stopped the car. I told her this can't be. I told her, are we on the correct street? We looked around and we were. We started freaking out and got on the car and left for work. But on our way back, we retraced our steps and went back and bam, the apartment complex we saw every day was there again, the one with the black gate. That different one we saw earlier was just not there anymore. My friend says we probably went to an alternate universe or dimension or something like that, or maybe it was just a glitch. And I'm glad I'm not crazy because I have her as a witness. This is the first time something like this has happened to me. And while yes, it was very freaky and scary, I'm also glad it didn't happen to me alone, or I would have felt like I lost my mind. Case file number 209, written by Nostril Nugget. A road we drove on often, vanished as if it never existed. My kid and I go ride daily. The kid loves to get out, listen to music and just cruise. I grew up here. 
I know the interstate, highways, and farm-to-market roads like the back of my hand. On one of our rides last week, this happened. There's this one farm-to-market road, which had been there for at least 40 years, that is often traveled by people who want to get off the interstate and have a peaceful six-mile drive through the woods to connect to another major road. The feeder road from the interstate is one way, and about half a mile to the FM road, then continues past the FM road and continues on for several miles. My kid and I got onto the feeder road and went the half mile to the FM road, except it wasn't there. No sign it had ever been there, just woods, not even a slight indication anything had ever been there before, even the road signs were gone, and it was eerily quiet. I couldn't hear road noise, or even music in the car. After we passed where the FM road should have been, about half a mile later, sound came back. We continued on and finished our ride, both wondering what happened. Today on our ride, we took the route again. Lo and behold, the FM road was back. I took it two different times just to make sure. My kid and I kinda laughed and looked at each other. I don't know what to make of it, but it surely was odd. Case file number 210, written by Pleasant Gap 5298. Blackout, winter, drinks. Let's walk back. It's just 10 minutes. Well, so we thought. I recently met up with some old friends and this story from 20 years ago came up. It's something I have never forgotten and have never been able to explain. Before I begin, I want to make it perfectly clear that none of us were drunk. There is no alcohol involved in the story whatsoever. A bit of setup. I live in a small town in England. The road where I lived at the time runs parallel to the high street with several pubs and one nightclub. Another road runs vertically to connect the two. Think of a capital letter I with the lines at the top and bottom. The local nightclub is at the bottom of the I and my flat at the top. It's a straight road about a 10 minute walk from one end to the other. This is important. Onto the story. Myself and four friends found ourselves in the local nightclub at around 11 p.m., stone cold sober, and we were queuing at the bar to get our first drinks of the night. Just before we got served, there was a power cut. Emergency lights came on, everyone escorted out of the club. The whole town was out. It was the middle of winter, so we decided to cut our losses and walk back to my place and finally have a drink. It was no later than 11.45 at this point, probably a bit earlier. We started the walk back to my place. It was incredibly dark and eerie, so we did what I think anyone would do in that situation. We tried to scare the crap out of each other. The walk was otherwise uneventful. We got back to mine and after fumbling around in the dark looking for a light source, we settled in and I started making us some long-awaited drinks. That's when one of my friends asked what time it was. Thinking this was another spooky story, I waited for the rest of it. I remember her voice chilling me when she said, No, seriously, what's the time? We all looked at our watches. We were all showing 3.20am, except one which had stopped at 1.05am. We don't know if that's important, because sometimes watches just stop. None of us remember anything unusual aside from the power cut, but somehow we lost around three and a half hours on a ten minute walk. While talking about this, my friends and I did create an approximate timeline of that entire evening to see if there were any gaps we could fill. Some of us remember things the others don't, but it was about 20 years ago, so I figure that's normal. We mostly recall it the same, and none of us have any idea where the three and a half hours went. The whole night was weird, but explainable up to that point. Case Notes, file number 210. <laughs> yeah, aliens baby, you know it. Time loss at night, multiple people with no recollection of what happened. Frankly, nothing else would make sense here, right? I wonder if it was aliens, were they responsible for the power outage too? Perhaps. Should be a trivial task for any species advanced enough to reach our planet. When you give it a few minutes of thought though, it's simultaneously exciting, wondrous for the truth that it conveys that technology could go so far beyond what we believe to be possible currently. But also, well it's terrifying. We're fully at the mercy of any such species. You know that quote, the whole advanced technology being indistinguishable from magic? Well it's true. If they want to abduct us, study us, destroy us, whatever, 
they will, and we wouldn't even know about it until it was over. Case file number 211, written by Takedo's Our Life. Babe is taking a shower late. Let's go check. He's not there. Long time ago now, since my ex. Maybe six years ago now. One morning I woke up having the day off. He was at work. But then I hear the shower nozzle turn on and the water turn on, and I think, oh, he got up late and is getting ready. I call out, Babe! And I hear him call out, Yeah! So I get up and walk around the bed to the bathroom, and I'm thinking about how I'm going to tease him about being late once I open the door. And I'm thinking of something to say, so my mind is distracted. But I know I hear the cat pop on a bottle of shampoo or body wash, and I open the door, and the curtain is open. The room is empty, and I didn't check but it did look like someone had showered, but he would have showered before he left for work an hour or so before I woke up. The room felt very heavy, and I actually closed the door after turning the lights on in the studio, bathroom, and kitchen area, because I'm a baby. Does this belong here? I know that place was horribly haunted, but this felt very weird. Like it had his essence. I can't explain it, but I can feel him walk into a room before you see him. He's a very grounded, highly in tune person. I can't explain it. If you know, then you know. But whatever this was, captured perfectly. Bonus file, written by Cotton Spectre. A powerful voice from within. In general, I believe in superstitions and bizarre phenomena, but I'm usually indifferent and not scared. I'm also not sensitive in terms of identifying unfamiliar energies, although I usually have a spot-on instinct with people and that's about it. However, there was this one time when I experienced something strange and not sure if this could be categorized as paranormal or other stuff. So my office building was a warehouse that turned into a two-story building in a loft style. The second floor was divided into right and left wings, separated by stairs, but it is basically open space that you can see almost the entire office in a glance. I was staying there late, until around 9pm. I was all alone, not only on the second floor, but in the building. There were these two janitors downstairs though, but they were smoking outside. The only part of the building that still had the lights on was my wing, but I didn't worry since I wasn't afraid. However, Suddenly I got this whisper that told me to go home. The voice didn't sound like scolding or warning me, and rather it spoke in a matter-of-fact tone. Moreover, what makes it extraordinary is I know fully well that it came from the very core of me, but it wasn't me, if that makes any sense. Also, although it spoke plainly and not really in a commanding way, I wasn't in fear whatsoever as well. I knew right away that I needed to comply, so I just left. I remember that I was really confused instead of feeling scared or anything because, again, I didn't feel like the voice had any intimidating intention, simply order. Has anyone experienced a similar thing? To this day, I still wonder what or who the voice is and why it came to me because there was not even the slightest danger in sight. Case file number 212, written by Boiled Egg. Darkness complete. One Mississippi. Normal. One morning or afternoon in the summer of 1999, my brother and I were home from school, hanging out in our living room playing cards on the rug. I remember this so clearly and I have never been able to come up with a reasonable explanation. Everything simply went dark. Not like the lights going out, but a complete loss of vision. I couldn't see my hands in front of my face or hear the traffic outside. This lasted for maybe a second, if that. I could probably have just counted one Mississippi, and then everything was back. My brother and I looked at each other, and a moment later, our mom walked in and said, What was that? The three of us were feeling shaken, and tried to write it off as a cloud passing over the sun, to make us feel better, but couldn't explain the sudden loss of sound. I know I've read a few accounts from others over the years of something very similar happening, but I've never been able to come up with a satisfactory explanation. Case file number 213, written by Meadows May 1130. A striking birthmark switched sides. My daughter called me frantic about a week and a half ago. She said, 
Mom, what side was my birthmark on? I was half asleep, but I thought about changing her diaper as a baby. It was on my right, so it would be her left. So I said, It's on your left thigh. She starts freaking out even more and tells me, That's what I thought. I knew I wasn't crazy. She had woken up that morning, and as she was getting dressed, she noticed the birthmark was on her right thigh. Now, this isn't some small birthmark that you could not see for months. If you ball up your fist and place it on the side of your thigh, that's how much area it took up. The birthmark is also raised, so even if she hadn't looked down for weeks, she would still feel it every time she touched her leg. It's also a very dark shade of brown, so it's not like it's hard to see, it's very noticeable. We both are now freaking out, going through old pictures and photo albums. Strangely, we can't find any of the pictures where her birthmark is visible. This means half of her pictures from her being a baby to a toddler, three or four, are missing all of a sudden. That's several photo albums. Her first birthday, her first time in a pool, all missing. So what the hell is going on? Case Notes, file number 213. So reading along I'm thinking, oh wow, another universal crossover event. But then I corrected my brain. That can't be, because it's your daughter calling you, telling you the birthmark switch positions on her body. If you had crossed over, it would be normal for her birthmark to be different on her body. She'd never have told you and you'd never have known unless you saw her swimming or something. And she didn't cross over, because the body is carried... Hang on, actually, I'm basically processing out loud here. When one crosses over, presumably, the physical body does not move along with them. So, if your daughter is from another universe now, just her consciousness, one of the main differences between her realities for her could be where her birthmark is on her body. Strange though that the pictures are gone. It may well be something else, but on that, I wouldn't know what. Case file number 214, written by Pushcart Vanny. Overnight, a pile of clothes got drenched, inexplicably. I don't even know if this is the proper sub for this, but as the title says, I woke up this morning to a pile of laundry in my room being completely drenched, as if I pulled it from the washer and just threw it on the floor. Let me be clear, I didn't wash the clothes. I've been pretty lazy lately, so the clothes have been sitting in that exact spot for about a week. I have no animals, no leaks from the ceiling or floor, the floor is completely dry underneath the pile, and it's pretty much just the top of the pile that's soaked. It has no smell. There is nothing in there that was able to be spilled. I know it seems like something really small, but I'm truly at a loss as to how this happened. It's as if they just got wet from nothing. As shameful as I am to admit it, I was actually going to wear a pair of the shorts that were in the pile, but they were soaked, otherwise I'd have never known. Yes, I checked all the pockets of my pants and shorts. Any insight into how water can just appear from thin air, enough to completely drench a pile of clothes without getting the floor wet at all. Edit. I've moved the clothes. I've replaced them with a couple of towels to see if it's a leak. I've also bought a carbon monoxide detector, but it takes a couple hours to register if the PPM is really low. There is a 0% chance that I peed or dumped water on my clothes. No chance. I would 100% know if it was urine based on my water intake slash diet, but admittedly, it is hilarious to think about. Edit 2. So I've tested for carbon monoxide. It's been about 2 hours, maybe 3 hours since I plugged the detector in, and so far, nothing. 50 ppm can take up to 8 hours to trigger the detector, but so far, it's looking like the CO poisoning theory is becoming less and less likely. Edit 3. For those of you unable to understand this, I will reiterate. I did not pee on my clothes. The liquid had no odor and no color whatsoever. Urine may not always have a color, but it always has a smell. Edit 4. Okay, it's been like 9 hours since I plugged in the CO detector, and we're all good here. I laid some towels down in the same spot where my clothes were yesterday, and they were dry today, so a localized leak is pretty unlikely as well. Here's where it gets weirder. There is a huge puddle of water that I stepped in this morning on the way to the laundry room. Not near the washer or dryer or water lines at all, just inside the doorway going from the kitchen to the laundry room, so the furthest point in the room from the appliances slash water lines. Bonus file, 
written by The Whale 13, The Graveyard Island, There Are Voices. In the 14th century, the plague had arrived here and with a vengeance sought out to kill everyone in sight. A few managed to escape to a decently large island in one of our biggest lakes in my country. But the plague wiped them all out, one after the other. In the end, the whole island turned into basically a large cemetery, or so I've heard. Another thing that is important to the story is that an author lived here in the 50s before moving to another one. The house and adjoining sheds still stand. If you have the patience to listen through this, I can promise you that you will be just as horrified as I was. I love the outdoors, and after coming across this island on Wikipedia, I just needed to go. And then the opportunity arose. My family and I found a road close by and followed a small path to a little peninsula. The island measured at the very least a half a mile long, and it was truly a sight to behold. It might not seem big, but when heavily forested and covered by cliffs and large hills, it's larger than you might think when on foot there. Well, I swam over there. It took about 5 minutes, and that was around 100 to 200 yards. The water was not warm, but perfectly cool enough to shield me from the blistering heat. Not too challenging, and I was in a very good mood to say the least. Immediately, I didn't find a path, and that's why I just walked until I found one. After coming across a little shelter, I continued to walk, and I was taken away by its enchanting beauty. Crisp blue water, which almost looked like a lagoon, 100 foot high cliffs on a small island in northern Europe. The truth was, it seemed so incredibly amazing, just too good to be true. My journey continued, and I went on. After finding the lagoon looking thing and being both bewildered and amazed, I continued. And I still regret that, so very much. The thing that I recall was that after I passed a little meadow, my mind immediately thought, this will take a dark turn. And maybe I just kind of made myself think that it was different, but it just feels like this cozy and wonderful atmosphere changed, and it all just seemed different after that. Well, you know how I mentioned the author's house? Yep. Abandoned since the 50s. I saw it, but before I could reach those forgotten and sad looking old buildings, I needed to cross some ferns. They didn't look odd or anything like that. It was just a path between some patches of waist high ferns. For every other step I took, I heard movement from the ferns. I stopped, looked around, and found nothing. Figured it was a rabbit or something. Took some more steps. The movement and snap of twigs got closer and closer. It was following me. Trying to shut out my increasing feeling of unease, I went up to see this old house. Coming closer, I saw how crappy it looked. The main house and the surrounding sheds looked beautiful, but long forgotten and neglected. The lake looking at me from behind the house was a bit of a relief. Then I heard voices. People were talking from inside or behind the house. Now I was seriously horrified and got a feeling of dread I had never felt before. I just wanted to jump into the lake and take an extra long route back so I wouldn't have to be there anymore. But whatever it was that talked, I never ever want to meet, ever. So I did the only thing I could do, I ran, past the ferns, still hearing it follow me. But after some very uncomfortable pacing, I finally crossed over the meadow and I felt better. In the end, I managed to swim back, but not until I came to the shore from where I arrived, I had a feeling that someone or something was following me. I still don't know what it was there on the island. It was so very beautiful, but I don't think I ever want to go back there. Case file number 215, written by Crushed Duke. A distinctive noise heard occasionally, from everywhere. Every once in a while, a number of consecutive beeps like something you would hear from a microwave or a vital signs monitor plays out, almost always at night. I don't recall when I first started hearing or noticing this, but I can't get it out of my mind. At first I thought it was from my neighbor, whatever it may be that would beep at 2am, as we had thin walls and I could always hear his dog scratching at the wall besides my bed. But I recently went on a camping trip with some friends, and to my creeped out surprise, there I was laying down on a thin blow-up mattress with legitimately no technology around me, 
when a string of the same high-pitched beeps coming from what felt like above me rang out. I've heard it while staying at friends' places and heard it driving at night. I'm not particularly concerned with it now, nor am I freaked out, but it's just a thing that hovers in my mind from time to time, and with anyone I've asked, they have never experienced it. I jokingly say I'm in some sort of simulation or a coma or something if I ever bring it up to someone other than my own thoughts, but I'd rather find a concrete answer rather than dabbling in insane theories that I pass off as jokes. Perhaps it's a hallucination when I'm tired, or maybe it's a sound in my head that my brain tricks my ears into hearing for real. Whatever it is, it's fun to think about and gets my head out of the strenuous thoughts of real life. And for those suggesting it could be tinnitus, while I suffer ringing immensely, my tinnitus feels way too in my head, opposed to the beeping that I can say with certainty is in one direction with depth to where it is. As well as that, I doubt the beeping that sounds exactly like a microwave or a retro digital alarm would be natural enough to warrant an exact copy for damaged eardrums. For comparison, that's like hearing the Windows XP error and blaming it on hitting your head. Case file number 216, written by Jeep to the beat. How did this home distort into a totally new layout? This is probably not an exciting story, but it's strange enough to share. Last year, my roommate and I were searching for a new place to rent. That day, we looked at five houses and still didn't find one we liked. Our agent knew we had to move out ASAP, so she looked through her sources and found one last house for us to look at. This particular house was last on our list because all the clients she showed the house to didn't like it, so she thought to not bother with it. It was a little further away anyways. She sent us the information and we drove out there to look at it. As it turns out, that house is the one we like. There was a den to the left as we walked in. There's a loft on the second floor to the left of the stairs. The master bedroom is across from the loft on the right side of the stairs. We signed the paperwork and were ready to move in 48 hours later. On the day of the move-in, we go to the house to drop off a few boxes before heading out to pick up the rental truck. As we entered the house, everything felt strange the moment we stood at the entrance. It did not look and feel like the house we saw two days ago. The den was now on the right as we walked in. The loft upstairs is now on the right side of the stairs. The master bedroom is to the left across from the loft. Basically, the entire floor plan was flipped, opposite of what we saw two days ago. We are sure and can confirm it's the correct address. We know for sure it's the house we looked at because it's across from a dog park and there's a red fire hydrant in front of the driveway. I know I wasn't losing my mind or forgetting the layout of the house. My roommate confirmed she too is confused about the floor plan of the house, that it was flipped around. We called our agent and asked her if she remembered seeing the den to the left or the right of the entrance. She said the den is on the right. We originally saw the den to the left, so that didn't really help our case at all. I don't understand it. Either way, we still like the house, even though the floor plan just flipped around. We're still living in this house now. Case file number 217, written by Nana2326. Temporary Oblivion. For the pillowcase. Hi guys, so this happened last week. I was changing my sheets and I vividly remember taking a sheet off that pillow. By the time I was done, the pillow was missing. When my boyfriend came home, we searched through literally the whole house, including closets, under the bed, etc. We couldn't find it anywhere, and we were really confused because the pillow is big. I don't like the necklace, so you can't see it. Anyway, my boyfriend slept without a pillow. Yes, we only have two pillows in the house. Next day I woke up. Pillow was still missing and later that afternoon, I went for a walk and when I came home, the pillow was standing right at the bottom of the bed. I was so confused. I asked my boyfriend if he found it. And he immediately says yes, but then when I asked where he found it, he says he has no idea, but he came home five minutes before me, so he must have found it really quickly. Anyway, he couldn't remember where he found it. We really don't know how to explain this. Case file number 218, written by Ugly Runner, The Great Pain Reset. I made the mistake of sliding on the beach to catch a ball. 
The coarse sand really did a number on my ankle, gouging out a fresh chunk of flesh that I rinsed in the ocean before limping back to our hotel. I made the mistake of getting in the hot tub. My ankle was barking prior, but it howled when I slowly lowered myself in the hot tub. Fast forward one week. This thing looks gnarly, and being right on the ball of the ankle made walking a nightmare and kept it from healing. My girlfriend and I were moving into a new apartment after our trip, and I remember the move was excruciating because of my now infected and uninsured ankle wound. I was nauseated and clammy. The pain was severe enough to bring sweat to my forehead when swiveling my suspended foot on its joint. Here's where it gets wild for me. The first night in our new apartment, as we're going to bed, I hobbled to the bathroom. I'm standing there before relieving myself, when I feel a sudden electric buzz throughout my body. The only way I can describe it is like when your leg falls asleep except full body. Then my vision slowly tunneled at the center of a surrounding snow. I woke up on the bathroom floor looking up at my panicking girlfriend. No big deal, right? I just fainted. Well, the pain in my ankle had totally disappeared. I could walk, run, jump, rotate freely, and nothing. The wound was still there, but the greens and yellows of it had vanished. I've never experienced anything so baffling. I went from a 10 to a 0 on the pain scale with just a little involuntary nap in between. How is this possible? Case Notes, file number 218. You, my friend, almost certainly experienced a quantum crossover. You likely describe the dying process, perhaps induced by sepsis of your ankle wound, and then you woke up in an alternate, but nearly identical, universe to your own. One where the ankle wound still occurred, but was far less severe. Bonus file, written by JXTPE. Communal showers gone paranormal. So, my school was haunted. I'll give a background before I tell you the encounter I had. I went to an all-boys boarding school from the age of 13 until just after my 18th birthday. My school was old, and I mean old. It was founded over 450 years ago, back in 1552. To put that into a little context for my American friends, that's 245 years before the USA was even founded. With a place that old, it carries things. As you can probably imagine, I have a lot of school stories from my five years of service at my school. My first couple of weeks at school were incredibly nerve-wracking. I had never spent more than a night or two away from home, so I felt homesick and overworked as I was getting used to my new work schedule. But I was making friends with some of the boys in my year and things were looking up. At this point, I was probably the smallest boy in my year. I hadn't hit my growth spurt yet and I wouldn't for a couple more years. The older boys in our schoolhouse would tell us stories of how the school was haunted and that we should never adventure alone past sunset. My friends and I did not believe them in the slightest. We assumed that they were just playing tricks on the new boys, but we were so wrong. I remember the first time something odd happened. I was quite under the weather and had a high temperature. This was within my first month of moving into the school. My teacher suggested that I should take a cold shower. It was late in the evening and showers were usually reserved for first thing in the morning unless you had PE that day. I remember feeling rather dizzy and so my friend offered to accompany me. We went down to the shower room together. Having showers at my school was probably the most awkward thing I remember about my time there. One big open room with a dozen or so shower heads. That was a tough thing to get used to when I first started but I did get used to it rather quickly. I was never really shy about my body or anything like that, but still, there were at least two and a half dozen boys in my schoolhouse, all crammed together in a completely open communal shower room. It was awkward to say the least. But back to the point, when my friend and I went down late in the evening, we placed our clothes under a shower head that wasn't going to be used by either of us and got in the shower. The hot water boiler would not have been on at that time in the evening, so my cold shower certainly was cold. After around 5 minutes, my friend and I stood in the freezing cold water. All at once, every unused shower turned on full blast. As well as that, the freezing water suddenly turned boiling hot, like red hot. I'm sure if my friend and I didn't manage to get out of the way of the water before it reached full temperature, we would have been burnt badly. We immediately made a run for the door of the shower room, 
but it was locked, and we couldn't get it opened. We started panicking as you could imagine, two naked 13-year-old boys slamming on the shower door with all we could muster. Then, almost as fast as they all started, the showers all stopped. I remember that my heart was racing like it had never raced before. I remember feeling as if I was drowning in steam from the showers. After that, the showers started spurting out something that looked like bright red blood, and I won't ever forget the smell, like rusty metal mixed with sewage. My friend and I were truly cowering at the door by this point. I'll speak for myself when I say that was the scariest thing I had ever experienced up to this point in my life. Then again, the water stopped, and the door unlocked. Our clothes were truly ruined, along with our towels. My teachers were very strict. They could be downright mean. You do not want to be punished at my school, and that's what terrified us more in that moment. We were more scared of being sent to the headmaster's office than we were of whatever event just happened, paranormal or not. So we did our best to clean up, but it didn't work. The room still looked as if a bomb had been dropped. So we went to our head of house and tried to explain what happened. He seemed confused, perhaps even slightly scared. He told us to go back to our dorm. The next day, the shower room was closed and we had to use another house's room. As I said, this was probably the first time I experienced something that I cannot explain. Whether it was paranormal or not, which personally, I'm almost certain it was. How else would all the showers turn themselves on and the door lock itself? And honestly, this is one of the mildest. The most terrifying stories come from when it was a school holiday and most children had gone home to visit their parents. I never did as my parents worked too much to look after me. When the school was quiet, I swear I could hear echoes of screams. Thinking about it still makes my skin crawl. Case file number 219, written by Dr. Marvel 4. Code red on the toilet and a girlfriend not where she's supposed to be. Last night I was sitting in the toilet, minding my own business. More on that later. After I took care of business, I got up to go check the front door. I opened it and no one was there. I then looked behind me and saw my girlfriend. I was shocked and asked her how long she had been there. She asked me if I'm pranking her, because in her perspective, she was at my place since last night. We talked about it and she is serious. I have no idea what to think of it, guys. Maybe it's because when I was doing my business in the bathroom, I was zoning out and had a fever kind of dream of a ghost entering my body and filling my chest with heat, which really freaked me out. I then had a serious case of code red in the toilet, which occupied my mind but for a moment. I was diagnosed with a crap disease a couple years ago, but never had such experiences until yesterday. Has anyone had similar experiences? Case file number 220. Written by Koala Sheep, her ring was out for a night on the town, the only explanation. I had the strangest experience with my nose ring a few months back that I still to this day cannot explain. It might not be crazy interesting and it's a bit long winded, but I have no logical answer. To preface this story, my job doesn't allow us to wear jewelry during shifts, so for a while I was wearing a wonky nose hoop that didn't fully shut which made it easier to take off before shifts each day. I had lost it a few times while sleeping, but always found it next to me within seconds. One morning I woke up and felt that my nose ring was missing, so I pawed around as usual until I could feel it. However, this time, it wasn't there. After sweeping my arm multiple times under my pillow and nearby blankets, with no success, I decided to open my eyes and actually start ripping the bed apart. My partner, who was heading out, Wished me luck as she couldn't continue to help. I threw off the pillows, pulled back the covers, still nothing. I even stood up and flicked up each blanket layer, shaking each one at a time, patting them down, expecting to hear a clunk as the piercing hit the floor, but again, nothing. After moving the bed frame, sweeping the entire room, which was quite small, really enough for a queen mattress and a few longboards, I returned empty-handed. I ended up rebuilding the room, moved the frame back, put on each sheet, pillows, etc. until the room looked exactly as it had, but still no nose ring. I was really frustrated after spending an hour to no avail and called my partner to let her know it was gone. She found it just as strange as I did, but suggested grabbing a box from the closet that might have an old nose hoop until we could buy a new one. 
After we hung up and I had grabbed the box from the closet, I turned around to sit on the bed and stopped dead in my tracks. The stupid nose ring was back, right on top of the crease-free top sheet, dead center of the bed, and shining in the sun. My nose ring was back. There was no way I could have missed it, and no way it could have even gotten there on its own after I rebuilt the bed. It was as if someone had placed it perfectly on top to taunt me after watching me search for it relentlessly. I swear, it must have teleported for an hour or glitched somewhere else during that time. It genuinely creeped me out, and when I told my partner, she couldn't think of a possible explanation either. I've never had an issue since, but I'll never forget how genuinely perplexed I was. Case Notes, file number 220. Man, disappearing objects are starting to drive me mad now. The only glitch I've experienced, as many know, and now I'm sitting here furious that I've lost yet another tennis ball. Just in my room, tossing it around, fumbled, heard it hit the floor, and then I look around everywhere and nope, it's just vanished from existence. At least your object came back. What's with me and tennis balls that vanish and never return? I feel so unloved. Just come back to me. Case file number 221, written by R.L. Yoshi. A true, unparalleled horror story. Wasted pizza. The other day, I brought a plate of pizza to my desk. I set it down, then went to grab something else, and suddenly heard a slight splatting sound. I turned back around and saw one slice of pizza was now on the floor, crust side down, thankfully. Thing is, I did not come into contact with the plate or pizza when turning, so I couldn't have knocked it off. The plate was also fully on the desk, not hanging over the edge, so it couldn't have fallen off on its own. And there was no wind or anything of the sort. My pizza just ended up on the floor in a way that would be totally normal if not for the fact that there was no way it could have gotten off the plate under the circumstances. Bonus file, written by JXTPE. Scavenging for food turned nightmarish. This takes place around two months after the last incident with the showers. It was the first Christmas holiday, and most boys were packing up to spend two weeks at home with their parents. My parents had already written to me and said they were too busy for me to come home, so I would be spending the holiday here. I have to admit, I was disappointed, but I did as I was told. All of the friends I had made left for holiday, so I was pretty lonely, but I was enjoying some rest time. For those of you who don't know how most boarding schools in Britain work, we had a six-day week. We had normal lessons all day from Monday through Saturday, and on Sunday, we had to attend a church service for the first half of the day. Meaning, we only got one afternoon off to rest in the week. So, I spent most of the time I was allowed in bed reading books. The weird things were more prominent when it was the holidays. It was as if whatever energies were there became braver when there were less people around. In my schoolhouse, around two and a half dozen boys, but only four had stayed for the holiday. Only one was the same age as me, and none had stayed from my dorm room. Which I have to admit, I was thrilled about. Well, I was at first anyways. The first couple or so nights went fine. I was doing my 13 year old boy thing and I won't go into any more detail about that. But after the first days of peace, the weird thing started again. At first, it wasn't anything major. Echoes of screams and moans coming from the courtyard, but I rationalized it as older boys playing pranks. But in truth, it did scare me. But I didn't want to appear weak or fall into their prank. So I slept through my fears and didn't ask any of the other boys to come and sleep in my dorm with me. So I slept, and when I woke, every other bed in my dorm apart from mine had been moved to the far side of the dorm. Which thoroughly freaked me out, but again, I assumed it was a prank from some of the older boys. And if it's one thing I had learnt by this point, if you're being pranked or joked on in any way, show no weakness or it will keep happening. I moved all the beds back myself and went down for a shower. When I got down there, there was another boy already in the shower room. I can't remember exactly how old he was, but he was in the older years, so probably around 15 or 16. For this story, I'll name him Toby. By this point, I was used to showering with others, so I didn't care that he was there at all. He told me his plan for sneaking down at night and breaking in to the dessert kitchen and having a midnight feast. He asked if I wanted to join him, and though I had never done anything against the rules before, he assured me that he had done it loads of times and had never been caught, so I reluctantly agreed. Later that day, 
I got ready in a suit of all black to be able to sneak around more effectively. Toby was just wearing his normal clothes and looked at me like I was a huge nerd when I explained my reasoning for my clothes. And so, we started sneaking down to the kitchen. When we got there, we started eating as much ice cream as we could. When suddenly, a whole shelf of tin food threw itself onto the floor and the kitchen door slammed themselves shut. I looked at Toby in a, what do we do, kind of way. We picked up food and left almost as quickly as we came. Toby and I started walking back towards our schoolhouse. This is the bit that still gives me the chills. We heard footsteps coming up the hall on the way back. We assumed this would be a teacher, but we found somewhere to hide until they passed. But no one came, and we carried on walking back towards our dorm. This is when I felt something grab my leg and yank it. I got back up. We looked around us and there was no one around. We started running because we were both freaked out when something yanked Toby's leg too. He fell, and he fell way worse than I did and banged the front of his head and it gave him a bloody nose. He got back up relatively quickly. He was a rugby boy and was used to this kind of thing. By this point, we were sprinting full speed back to our schoolhouse. We got back and we swore we wouldn't speak of what happened again, out of fear of getting in trouble. I went to my dorm and tried to sleep, but I was just too terrified of what just happened. After a couple hours of just laying, I managed to get some sleep. I woke up at some point in the night to my bed along with the others in my dorm being slammed into the far side of the room with force. At this point, I was completely over having my dorm room. I got up and went into Toby's dorm. I explained what happened in my dorm to someone I thought would understand me. He told me he knew what I was talking about and told me to make a bed in his dorm, and I slept in there for the rest of the holiday. On the plus side, Toby looked out for me during the time he was at the school, and we still keep in touch even now. Case file number 222, written by Thin Man. His friend was casted in a random book he just picked up. I wouldn't say that this was creepy, but it's definitely one of the most quaintly surreal things I've ever experienced. So, back in 2016, I was injured at work and for about 6 months of my life consisted of going to physical therapy and being confined to bed until I could walk again. With that in mind, I had a lot of time to read books. One of the books that I was reading was X Heroes by Peter Kleins. Now I don't know about anyone else, but when I read a book I like to cast the characters in my head coming up with how they look. One of the minor characters in this book was named Ilya, and, because I know someone named Ilya, and because the book is set in Los Angeles where I live, the Ilya in my book became the Ilya that I knew in my imagination. But then, something strange started to happen. The Ilya in the book made specific references to movies like Aliens, a movie which the Ilya I know is a huge fan of. The Ilya in the book was a big fan of firearms, as the Ilya that I know is too. Put into words, these details seem slim, but there was something so strange about the character in this book that I eventually reached out to the Ilya that I knew to ask about it. Turns out that he knows the author, Peter Kleins, who had put him in the book. What are the odds that I would choose to buy a random book with a story that takes place essentially on my street in Los Angeles and features someone I know in real life as a minor character? That just blew my mind and it's easily one of the most surreal experiences I've ever had. Case file number 223, written by Torn Black Jacket. Was it an elaborate crime, a government conspiracy, or even aliens? Not a big believer in the paranormal, so I tried to come up with a semi-rational explanation of what happened, but I'm still very unconvinced and confused, and now I'm just willing to hear everyone else's insights or theories so I can maybe find something I missed. I live with my sister, and neither of us has a car, so we have to walk pretty much everywhere. We also tend to go places together since we don't exactly feel safe by ourselves in our town. Let's just say it's not a nice neighborhood for women to be walking alone. We were walking back from the store and we decided to take a shortcut down this one alleyway. While we were in the alley, I noticed a woman, maybe around our age, so early 20s, walking towards us. We made eye contact and I just froze for some reason. It felt like I'd just been stunned. The woman stopped and started speaking to us, and that's where my memory just sort of goes blank. The next thing I know, I'm in bed and it's four hours later. I don't remember walking home or falling asleep. 
I shook my sister awake and she was just as confused as I am. That woman is also the last thing she remembers, but neither of us can remember what the woman said, just said her eyes were red and her voice was relaxing, I guess. When she walked up to us, I remember feeling like I was on edge, but my body was too relaxed for me to move or do anything. So anyway, we checked the time and we had lost about 4 hours. Our jewelry was gone and so was the stuff we'd gotten at the store. Also, my sister's wallet was empty. It sounds insane, but it's like the woman hypnotized us and then took our stuff. I don't know how else to explain it other than that. I've been hypnotized before and it felt kind of similar, but I also remember being told that you can only be hypnotized if you give the hypnotist consent. I tried to do a tiny bit of research and there are apparently some alleged cases of robbers hypnotizing people, but it's never more than one victim and it's never as dramatic as losing 4 whole hours. Plus, most people will just wake back up where they were standing. I have no idea how my sister and I got back home and into bed. The one person I told said it sounded like an alien abduction, but that's way too far-fetched for me to buy into as a theory. Anyone got any ideas? At this point, I'll even consider really outlandish theories because I'm just totally lost trying to find something rational. Update. People in the comments wanted an update, especially with regards to the drug test we were given to see if we had in fact been drugged. Just as a bit of a warning, this might sound like I'm insane or something. When I made my original post, I was just looking for an explanation. People have given me some rather outlandish theories which, at first, I didn't see much value in. I figured it would be something like a robbery assisted with the use of drugs somehow, or maybe it was some form of hypnosis. Now I think there is something really weird going on. So it took a little longer than expected to get the results of the drug test back, but we eventually got called down to the police station to hear out the results, which we thought was odd. We were originally told we'd get our results back via email. When we got there, we were greeted by officers we hadn't spoken to before. It wasn't the ones we had discussed our situation with. Again, not sure if this is normal or not. They sat us down in one of the rooms and told us that our test showed signs of high marijuana and alcohol levels. My sister and I were really confused by this since we don't drink alcohol or smoke, and those don't seem like things we could get injected with or unknowingly drugged with. They essentially said, We know you were willingly intoxicated at the time of the supposed incident. You spent your money and lost your jewelry somewhere. Then you went back home and fell asleep. No crime was committed. We tried to argue that this was impossible but they just kept repeating themselves, trying to convince us that our amnesia was just because we were blackout drunk. Then they accused us of fabricating the story about the woman. We were told that if we ever tried to report a crime like that again, we'd be fined or detained for filing false reports. I'm not the kind of person to believe in conspiracy theories, but my sister said it felt like a cover-up, and honestly, I feel like that too. I don't know what to make of this situation, and I feel kind of lost. I have no idea what to do now other than post it here and hope someone can make sense of it. If I can't go to the police, I don't know where else I can go. Case Notes, file number 223. Hey, you mentioned aliens so I have to pop in for just a second. But sadly I have to agree, this doesn't strike me as aliens either. Especially with the update. It's clear the cops don't agree with you, but this doesn't really mesh together since as you say, you don't drink or use marijuana. So how did both of those substances get into your systems? The only thing I can think is that the lady somehow hypnotized both of you, simultaneously, perfectly, then injected you both with alcohol and the chemical substance of marijuana so that if you did report it, you'd sound like pranksters filing a false police report for attention. But I mean, that's a level of scheming that puts Mission Impossible to shame. So what else could it be though? The government conspiring to steal a small amount from both of you? Maybe the CIA testing a new weapon out. Bonus file, written by That Canopy. A hidden message in plain sight. In June of 2020, I experienced a miscarriage from an unplanned pregnancy. I found out at 4 weeks exactly, then lost it at 8 weeks. The event as a whole was one of the worst things I've been through, something you can't imagine until you're a part of that unfortunate club. A few months after miscarrying, I talked with my husband about getting a tattoo in remembrance of our loss. I didn't want anything with a name or a date, so I settled on a green gradient rainbow. Rainbows are popular in the pregnancy loss community, 
and green reminded me of nature and regenerative life. On January 14, 2021, my projected due date, I got the tattoo. It turned out nothing like how I imagined. There were miscommunications on both mine and the artist's side, and I was just so bummed out about the tattoo. After letting it fully heal, I shared my thoughts with my husband and said that I'd like to start the process of getting it removed and trying a different idea. It has such a personal and emotional meaning to me that I really wanted to love it and be so proud to show it off. I'm a hairstylist and I come into contact with lots of different folks and I'm very accustomed to talking about a range of subjects, even those that are very personal. I haven't shared my miscarriage with many people or clients, but a few weeks ago I did. I found myself on the topic with a girl who I've only seen twice. It was a much deeper conversation than I expected, but not unusual as many people share their lives in my chair. In the mirror reflection, she could see my inner forearm, where my tattoo is located, while I was blow drying her hair, and she asked me what it meant. I told her it was my baby tattoo. Why does it say hi in it? She asked. I immediately shot my eyes to my arm and saw what she saw. Holy crap. The area where my tattoo had healed badly now clearly has two letters visible. H. I. For six months I saw it as a smudge, but now it was so clear. See for yourself. We both sat in disbelief for a moment and got teary-eyed. I couldn't believe that this tattoo had this message on it for months on my own body and I never noticed it. I showed my husband and he too was in disbelief. There's no way I could intentionally make it heal weird in one spot and have it shape letters, nor could the artist happen to leave this area less saturated than the rest. It has truly shown me the power of our interconnectedness, and I find comfort in the inexplicability. I'm not sure if I will go through with the removal process or not, but I'm definitely proud to show off my message and share our story. Edit. Thank you for the awards and all the kind, supportive words. It's comforting to me to see others find comfort in this too. We are all so connected, it's hard to deny that with stories like this. Edit 2. Thank you again for the supportive and loving comments and for sharing your own stories. I welcome the skeptic thoughts. Others are allowed to have their own view of things, just as I am allowed to have mine. Regardless of how it got there, it brings me comfort, and comfort is something you are desperate for after any type of loss. That being said, I have made healing progress in the years since the loss happened, and it is easier to share and talk about now. We have grown into it and with our grief, and are better people for it. Case file number 224, written by Bastards of Midnight, a vivid dream of her beloved dog. Three years ago, my childhood dog died very suddenly and unexpectedly. She was sick for a few days, but turned it around and got better before dying very quickly and painfully in my dad's arms. I live out of state, so I wasn't able to be there for any of it. It's a six hour drive, and I felt very, very guilty about her passing without me being there. I had a very deep connection to her, and she had been my best friend for 12 years. I was devastated by her death. I couldn't work or eat or do much of anything. I was constantly bursting into tears. It was just awful. My heart just aches and I found myself apologizing to her for not being there. I just felt so guilty. One night I had a dream about her. I dreamt I was in this empty space and Charlie came running up to me, whimpering excitedly. She was licking my face and generally just freaking out and I was sobbing. I knew she was dead and I knew she was visiting me in my dream. I was very aware of it all. I kept hugging her and crying and apologizing and she just kept licking my face and being affectionate. I woke up with tears streaming down my face and sat up in my bed. I could still smell her distinctive smell and on my sleeve I pulled off one of her hairs. She had never been to my apartment and I hadn't seen her recently. It wasn't cat hair either as Charlie was a collie mix and their fur pattern is very distinctive. It may all be a coincidence but it was so vivid and real. I like to think she was visiting me to let me know everything is okay and not to worry. I haven't had a dream like that since. Case Notes, file number 224. So simple, such a beautiful experience to have. Proper closure after your best girl passed on. I'm right there with you in the belief that her essence was still there, at least in some part. 
It's often said that animals can sense otherworldly beings, ghosts and so on, but it may carry over for us in sensing them too, or even connecting with them after they die. Case file number 225, written by Healing Potato Lemon, a mother outside of space and time. This is something that has bothered me for over a decade, so I wanted to post to get some other people's perspectives. When I was a teenager, my parents and I lived in a large house where their master bedroom was on the first floor and my bedroom was upstairs with the other bedrooms. I have an older brother, but he had been moved out of the house for years at this point. My bedroom was at the end of a long carpeted hallway and the stairs were all the way on the other side of the second floor, so it wasn't uncommon to not hear someone approach my room. It was around 10 p.m. and my parents had gone to bed. It was a school night, so I was supposed to be sleeping too, but I was awake messaging my friends on AIM, showing my age here. My door was barely cracked open at the time. My bedroom light was off, but my attached bathroom light was on which dimly illuminated my bedroom doorway. I looked up to see my bedroom door swing open 18 inches or so, and my mom's dimly lit face looking at me for one to two seconds from the hallway and then the door shut, completely latched now. My dog at the time was laying on my bed, and he looked up too. After the door shut, he sat at attention at the end of my bed like he was ready to protect me. My mom has very dark hair, and I remember thinking her hair looked a lot lighter at that moment. This will be more important later. My mom has always been quite passive-aggressive, so my first thought was that she saw I was still awake on my computer, was pissed, and stormed off. I yelled out, Mom? Mom? several times, and she didn't respond. Our home phones also functioned as intercoms between one another, showing my age again, so I used the home phone in my bedroom to call the home phone on my mom's bedside table. It took her several rings to pick up, and when she answered, she sounded tired. I started defending myself and apologizing for still being awake, and then asked what she wanted and why she didn't respond when I yelled out to her. She was quiet for a few confused seconds and then started asking me what I was talking about because my call had woken her up. I then asked her what she was talking about because I had just seen her open my bedroom door, look at me, shut the door and walk away. She had no idea what I was talking about and sounded generally annoyed that I woke her up. She told me I shouldn't be awake anyways to go to bed and hung up. After that conversation, I started freaking out because I knew what I saw. I wasn't tired or on the verge of falling asleep in bed, or anything that could be explained by visual hallucinations caused by drifting off to sleep. I started thinking about how my mom's hair looked lighter than normal when I saw her, and realized it looked just like my aunt's hair before she had lost it to chemo. My mom and aunt looked almost identical in stature and build, and in their faces too, with the only difference being my aunt's hair being a dirty blonde color. They both kept their hair at shoulder length and had the same soft waves. My aunt, unfortunately, died from breast cancer a month or so prior to this happening, so my mind jumped to it being a paranormal experience. I didn't share those details with anyone after this happened, out of fear they would think I was crazy. I haven't had anything like this happen since. It's worth noting for anyone that looks at my post history that I do have epilepsy, but I have never had visual auras or visual experiences, and I didn't have any other symptoms of my focal seizures when this happened. Case file number 226, written by Tombo6969, his doppelganger chasing after his girlfriend. For the sake of context, I'll start by saying that when I was in my late teens, I used to live in a small town just outside Hamburg, not far from my girlfriend at the time. We used to spend a lot of time together and go out for lots of walks as neither of us had cars. Every few days I would walk her to Farschul, driving school, just up the road, her classes always started pretty late into the evening, and it was winter in Germany, so the days were very short and it got dark very early. I used to hate when she would walk there alone. Furthermore, after dropping her off at her classes, I always tried to be there to walk her home also. I would simply depart after dropping her off and return after the duration of her class. This is where crap gets weird. One particular evening, I dropped her off as normal, only about a 20 minute walk traversing a quiet wooded park and a few short side streets to get there. I left to go back home for about an hour or so, then departed early so that I could catch her before she left. 
For some reason, I arrived especially early this time and had to wait outside for about 20 minutes. It was very dark, and I was simply sitting at the bus stop across the street from the school. I waited and waited and waited and she just wasn't exiting the doors to the school. I sat outside for probably 35 minutes just waiting there. It should be noted that I didn't have my phone on me at the time. I had thought it would just be a quick and easy excursion, so I didn't bring it. Clearly a mistake. At this point, I of course start to ponder. Has she already left? I must have missed her. She should be finished by now, etc. After about 40 minutes went by, I started contemplating heading back the way I came to see if she was walking alone, but I didn't want to risk it just in case she hadn't actually left yet, so I remained there, waiting nervously. This is the really weird part. I'm sitting there tapping my foot and I see two people with flashlights walking up the street from the opposite direction, apparently looking for someone. I was like, what the hell? I got up and approached to see what was going on. The two people searching were my girlfriend, who I was waiting for, and her mother. As soon as they saw me approaching, they said, There you are! We've been looking all over for you! Where the hell have you been? And what the hell have you been doing all the way back here? I said, What do you mean? I've been here for 40 minutes waiting for you to leave school. Where did you two just come from? What's going on? I finished early today and started walking back alone. I wasn't able to contact you, because I had no phone, but I saw you following me. Why are you back here now? This isn't funny. I was dumbfounded. What are you talking about? I've been right here for 45 minutes straight. Now this is what my girlfriend saw from her perspective. After leaving slightly early from her class that day, she began walking astutely back home after noticing I hadn't arrived to pick her up yet. Assuming she would bump into me on the way, she wasn't worried about walking home alone, and she confidently began heading home. She spotted me about 500 meters away and witnessed me crossing the street, which I had actually done while walking toward the school. She expected me to approach her and greet her, but it seems I didn't notice her across the street, and we walked right by one another. This was the last time she actually saw me before meeting me again at the bus stop. Regrettably, I used to be quite the prankster. I was always teasing and messing with her, so she assumed that's what I was doing then. She thought I was intentionally ignoring her so that I would sneak around and scare her or something. I don't know. Either way, she didn't call my name because she thought I was being a dick. The creepy part. So after that initial interaction, I shortly thereafter arrived at the bus stop and proceeded to wait. She, on the other hand, had a very eventful walk. After she saw me initially, she kept walking towards home, expecting me to jump scare her or whatever, and her expectations, to her, seemed to be fulfilled. She began hearing footsteps behind her about 10 meters away. She knew it was me just messing with her. She then looked back and what she saw was me following her in my exact outfit, walking exactly how I walk, just following her and staring at the ground. According to her, it was my exact face, hair color, and even physical demeanor. To her, it was beyond the shadow of a doubt that it was me following her. So damn strange. The doppelganger said nothing, never looked up, and kept a consistent 10 meters behind her. He followed her for a few minutes down the road, just being creepy as all hell. She of course turned forward again, and laughed at my supposed pathetic attempt to scare her, yet after an amount of time had passed, she started getting weirded out and wondering what the hell I was doing. Shortly thereafter, the footsteps stopped and she lost me around a bend in the road. She looked back confused and even called my name to no avail. She shrugged and continued forward through the wooded park near her home. It was a very quiet, dark, and creepy part, but she powered through it. Quick reminder that this entire time I was actually sitting at the bus stop. About halfway through the small park, she hears footsteps again but they were much faster and heavier. She turns around to once again see me, sprinting towards her at full tilt, baggy jeans, heavy sweater, just sprinting as fast as I could. She saw my eyes glaring into hers and like staring into her soul. At this point, she was startled. She didn't know what was happening and I was apparently booking it straight towards her. As the doppelganger got about 10 meters away, he turned and ran down another pathway in the park, running towards a non-lit, pitch-dark section of the park sprinting as fast as he could, like what the hell is going on? She watched as I sprinted into the darkness and faded from view. The immense confusion sparked some worry in her. She was almost home and thought maybe I was running around to meet her on the other side of the park or something, 
Also, she just wanted to get the hell out of that creepy ass park. She really gave that doppelganger the benefit of the doubt that night though. So she arrives home, asks her mother if I've arrived, and then sure enough, I never showed up. She tells her mom the whole story and they began to worry something was wrong. They waited a few minutes, then decided to look around for me. When their attempts failed, they thought to look around near the driving school again and that's where they found the real me at the bus stop. That's basically the whole story. It was extremely peculiar and since that day, about 6 years ago, I've been wondering what the hell it could mean. I've heard that doppelgangers are omens of death, but lately I've been thinking maybe it was some elaborate glitch or some kind of intersection of universes. What do you guys think? Case file number 227, written by J94C. Gravity was cancelled. When I was about 17, I was playing football, soccer for my American friends, with my mates in the park. I jumped up to head the ball. I'm a pretty short dude, not exactly the most athletic person, so it's not like I was trying to jump like Michael Jordan or anything. But I can safely say I've never jumped higher than I did that time, either before or since. It felt like I wasn't going to stop. When I reached my apex, I stopped mid-air. It was only for a brief moment, but I felt my body become weightless before I began my descent. I'm trying my best not to say I floated, but that was how it felt. I wasn't even going to try to bring it up with my friends at the time, although it confused me. I knew if I had said anything they would have just shrugged me off, so I wasn't going to bother. It wasn't until everyone was asking me how I was able to jump so high and stating that they saw me stop mid-air that I started to freak out. Having them all confirm that they actually saw what happened made me think that this was a real glitch. Case file number 228, written by Blumpkin Dude. A party in the gym. A party that never happened. I went to the gym late at night with my then girlfriend, now married, and she went to go swim some laps while I went to the massage chairs. For her, this was a light workout. So about 30 to 40 minutes later, she came to where I was and explained what happened. She had been swimming and an old white guy, maybe in his 70s, jumped into the pool into her lane, wearing a black speedo. She stood up in the pool to yell at him about being in her lane. Nobody else was there, so it isn't like there weren't empty lanes. So as she's yelling at him, somebody behind her says, Hey, who are you talking to? And she turns around and sees a younger guy, Hispanic looking, blue shorts and no shirt. Maybe in his 20s or 30s. She said she was talking to that guy and turned around to point at him, but he was gone. Then she turned back to the guy standing on the deck who was also gone too. I went into the men's locker room to see if anyone was in there, but it was empty except for the cleaning guy. The gym had less than a dozen people there. This was at like 2am. The gym is 24-7. I asked the girl at the front desk if she saw anybody matching that description in the last few hours. It was a pretty slow night in the middle of the week, so she probably would have remembered that. The gym has surveillance cameras and after a week, we got to see the tapes and there was nobody there, just my wife. So would this be a glitch in the matrix? Case file number 229, written by Burnt Orange 101, the dihydrogen monoxide switcheroo. Today after work, I went to pick up my dog, heading to the beach to meet my parents and kids, roughly a 3.5 to 4 hour drive. As I began my drive, I decided to stop at McDonald's for a quick bite to eat because I hadn't had dinner yet and I wasn't going to arrive at the beach until around 9 to 9.30. I ordered a combo meal and wasn't really feeling a soda at the moment, so I ordered a bottle of water instead, only to be completely baffled by the fact that the employee at the drive through window handed me a bottle of Aquafina, blue lid and everything. I was so pressed over this that I even stopped my car and frantically googled, McDonald's started serving Pepsi products? And bottled Aquafina at McDonald's. I found nothing really, except results for some weird tweet that Pepsi made earlier this year about BK, McDonald's, and Wendy's, and a bunch of results, crossing out Aquafina and replacing it with Dasani. So I was like, okay, whatever. I guess this McDonald's was simply out of the Dasani water that they usually serve with the McDonald's logo on them, and had to run to the closest store to grab some cases. Things happen. Well, about halfway through my drive, I reached down and grabbed my bottle of water, just to get this huge knot in my stomach out. And legitimately, 
I nearly wrecked my car because I'm in so much shock over the fact that my bottle of water, now clear as day, says Dasani and has a green lid. It morphed from Aquafina into Dasani. Case file number 230, written by Los Angeles 323 LOL. Bar cast spell, fear. It's very successful. Here in Los Angeles, California, in East LA, in the bad part of town, there used to be a little dive bar where we used to go. We have many good memories, vids and pics of all the good times we had there. Also drinks were really cheap. A beer was $2 which is really good when compared to other bars where the same beer is 7 or $8. The only thing I didn't like is that they played Spanish music really loud, and I mean so loud you could hear it a block away. But whatever, we went because drinks were cheap and everyone working there knew us because we were regulars and they were so nice to us and they also had pool tables. We were heartbroken when they closed down the place. The owner told us the rent was getting too expensive and she couldn't afford it anymore. And this was before the virus when they shut down. So they had been closed down for more than a year, almost two years. And the place looks run down already. Gangsters spray painted all over it. It looks really sad. So two days ago, my aunt that lives in East LA called me and told me she was having a barbecue and to bring my friend over. So we went there, to her house. I drank a few beers. Then at around 11 at night, my friend and I decided to walk home. I know it's a bad idea, especially in East LA which is considered a bad area with a lot of gangsters. But we had a few beers in us and we felt rather brave. So we started walking. And as we were getting close to the street where the bar is, we heard loud music. Mexican music. We were thinking, what the hell? So we continued walking further until we got to the bar. And we almost crapped our pants. We froze. It didn't look run down anymore. It looked like it did two years ago when it was open. And we heard laughs and people singing karaoke inside. But I noticed something strange. The door was open, but it looked pitch black. We couldn't see anything inside which was really strange because usually in that place, you could always see a bluish purplish light in the door because they had a bead curtain in the entrance, so you could see the bluish light coming from the inside. But this time, it looked pitch black which was freaky, and I was about to step in when my friend pulled me from the neck of my shirt, and I even got mad. I was like, what the hell? This is my favorite shirt, you're gonna stretch it out. She screamed at me and told me, don't go in! And that's when I turned around and it hit me like a ton of bricks. I felt fear. Something told me, don't go in. I immediately felt something very wrong and so much fear. I told my friend, you're right, let's get the hell out of here. We ran home. We got there and were pretty shook up. The next day we went there again. The place looked run down again and dirty. We asked around locals, the people there, if they had been open the night before. And everyone laughed in our face and told us, what the hell are you guys smoking? This place has been closed down for two years and it certainly didn't open last night. We both felt so stupid, but we know what we saw and we weren't even drunk at all. We only had two beers so we weren't drunk and we certainly hadn't done any drugs to hallucinate, so what we saw was real. I'm glad I have my friend as a witness. I just think, glitch? Parallel universe? And what would have happened if I had gone in there? Like I said, something stopped me. I felt this resonating fear, more potent than I've ever experienced before. Something warned me not to go in there. Get away. Case file number 231, written by Tepec01. A crash and a call. This happened a long time ago, late 80s. It was a summer before my senior year in high school. My sister was visiting my grandmother, and it was just my mom and myself at home. About 1am, the phone rings. Woke both of us up, because getting a middle of the night call then just wasn't normal. My mom answers, her face instantly showing a bunch of worry and shock and concern. Hangs up, turns to me, tells me my stepfather had called and to get in the car, we have to go pick him up. He'd gone out earlier that night with a friend of his. We went to a friend's house, it's a little bit out into the country. No cars in the driveway, but just the front door is open. Both of the friend's dogs are just laying down in the living room. The porch light and all the lights in the house are turned on. We walk through the house calling for them and get no answer. Dogs pay us no mind. 
We're only there a couple of minutes when my stepfather pulls up in his van. It was one of those old Chevy cargo vans that had the spare tire mounted in the front. Tire is missing. Front of the van is crushed in more than a little. He and his friend get out of the van and look at us in surprise and shock, trying to find out why we were even there. Turns out they had been in an accident, swerved to miss a deer, and hit a tree. Tire on their front probably saved their lives. They were going to go to the friend's house to call my mom because it was the closest place to where they were and they didn't feel safe enough to drive all the way to the hospital. My stepfather ended up with more than a dozen stitches going into his hairline from where his head had hit the steering wheel. It was the weirdest experience I've ever had in my entire life. Between the phone call and the house all lit up but empty, the dogs just chilling out in the living room, it makes the hair on my arm stand up even now so many years later. Case Notes, file number 231. By the way, do you remember the details about the voice your mom heard from your stepdad during the call? Did it sound like he was hurt, that it was an emergency in that moment? I'm guessing by her reaction that was the case, but it's quite something indeed. And the friend's house, was he home? Seems odd that the front door was just open at 1am. Did the friend get the call too? The author responded to my comment, saying, as far as I'm aware, she did think it was my stepfather calling and didn't look particularly spooked, like he didn't sound right or something, just worried and concerned because he said he'd been in an accident. My stepfather and his friend had gone out for the evening. Don't remember what, why, or where. The friend's house was the closest location to the accident that they felt they could get to to safely call my mom and have her take them to the hospital. We arrived at the friend's house before they, stepfather and friend, arrived from the scene of the accident. The accident was on the country road, and if I remember right, the location of the accident wasn't very close to any other houses or farms or anything like that, so they had to travel a little bit to get to a phone and the friend's house was reasonably close. We never had any idea why the door was open or the lights were on. It was just one more strange thing on a very strange night. Case Notes, file number 232, written by Jackie Sparrow, A Glitch of Light. A few weeks ago, my girlfriend and I were driving back late at night from the carnival. The particular road we took was empty, as it usually is in that part of the country. There's no lights at the side of said road, and it was foggy. While we were driving, a sudden single light pops up behind the car, maybe about a kilometer away, moving closer at a very fast pace. I said to my girlfriend, Hmm, that motorcyclist is very brave. He's moving fast. She looks around and she says, yeah, he is. At about 500 meters, maybe closer, he suddenly steers off to the right, which was odd because there was no exit, just a straight road with forest and a ditch on both sides. Thinking he had an accident, we stopped and drove to where the light disappeared. The grass seemed as if someone actually did go through, but no one was to be found. Being an abandoned part of the country, we didn't feel like we should be going into the forest because we seriously could get lost in the dark. And besides, if someone did have an accident, they'd be in the ditch or the grass behind the ditch. We just shrugged it off and went on our way. Not even a minute later, the light appeared again, this time entering from the left and moving even faster. When the light was very close, I couldn't see it in my mirror anymore, like it should be at a dead angle. I looked to my left where it should have been, and nothing was there. My girlfriend was seriously freaking out and said to not stop no matter what. We didn't encounter any more strange lights that night. Case file number 233, written by My Home on Whore Island, Glitch in the Waitress. I was just telling a friend this story today and thought to also post it here, so for your glitching pleasure, here we go. About five years ago, I was serving at a Greek diner. One slow night, I see a woman walk in, about 50 years old, with a little boy tagging along behind her. He looked about 10, with a yellow shirt. I saw them head to a table, so I stood behind the bar and started pouring water to bring over. The kid was about the right age to be too old for our kid cups, so I casually asked the other server working, Hey, Nicole, do you think that little guy is big enough for an adult cup? Or should I bring a kitty instead? Nicole looked up at me, confused, and said, What little guy? Well, that little boy that came in with the lady over there. I glanced over and now she's seated, alone. She came in by herself, said Nicole. 
No, I saw him. He was about yay high, yellow shirt, um, maybe ten? She looked at me again and said, Okay, now you're creeping me out. She came in alone, I swear. There is no little boy. I was shocked, folks. I asked Nicole to take the table for me. Part of me wishes I had told the woman, but I was afraid she'd think I was nuts. Hell, I thought I was nuts. I swear on all that is holy. I saw that little boy, just as clear as anything. He was there, and then he just wasn't. Case file number 234, written by The Man, The Beard, a door forced open by itself. When I was a teenager, my family lived in a big 115-year-old brick house. Plenty of creepy stuff happened, but one night I was heading to bed when the door between the first floor kitchen and the basement stairs absolutely slammed shut. It had a unique sound that I recognized immediately as a kitchen slash basement door. There were no windows open that could have caused a draft. Our dog was asleep on the second floor. I was on the second floor. My parents were both asleep in the third floor attic, which had been converted to a master bedroom. None of us could have shut the door. Now I'm freaking terrified. I worked up the courage to go investigate, carrying my hilariously teeny pocket knife for protection. As I went downstairs, I turned on every light. When I reached the kitchen, the door was wide open. Even more freaked out, I ran back up to bed, leaving the lights on. A minute or two later, I heard a definite, shh, okay, okay, from downstairs. I laid in bed and was ready to accept my demise. Eventually, I somehow fell asleep and in the morning, I was there first, downstairs. I woke up before my parents and our dog, and found that the lights were all off and the basement door had been shut again, but nothing anywhere was stolen. Case file number 235, written by Watermelly3. Free, sucker! Now press play. About two years ago, I went to collect my husband from the ferry after work. My husband got into the car, and as I was driving very slowly out of the car park, we both noticed two people standing a few meters in front of our car. It looked as though they were strangers, older-looking professionals, both walking to their separate cars in different areas of the car park. The man was reaching into his side bag, and the lady was further ahead than the man, with her head turned to the right. I know the exact positions they were in, because they were completely frozen on the spot. My husband and I sat there watching the frozen strangers, not saying anything to each other, and then all of a sudden, it was like someone pressed play, and the two strangers just continued on like nothing had happened. My husband and I promised each other that we would never forget how weird the experience was, I can't remember exactly how long they stayed frozen like that, but it was long enough to freak us both out. Bonus file, written by Fright Yagami, a stalwart defender against evil. I grew up in an eight bedroom farmhouse with my dad until I was old enough to move out. We always had extra rooms not being used, and because of the age of the house plus all this extra space, there was always an eeriness like someone was looming in the shadows. If I had to get a drink in the middle of the night, I looked at the ground the whole time because I was scared of what may be looking back at me from the dark corners, rooms, and hallways. Even the windows and mirrors were avoided because I wasn't sure what I'd see looking back at me. When I was around 12 years old, I questioned why the room that used to be my nursery was locked from the outside. I didn't think it was weird before then. My dad needed a room for storage, and I figured he just wanted to keep me out, for whatever reason. I brought it up to him one day, asking what's so important in there that he needs to keep me out even though I'm not a child anymore. Typical 12 year old mentality. Turns out that I was not entirely correct about the lock. My dad with a very serious demeanor sat me down and answered my inquiry. When I was a baby, one to two years old, I slept in this nursery room on the second floor next to my dad's room. This room was painted by my sister especially for me with Winnie the Pooh characters and fluffy clouds, the type of thing I think back on and appreciate. The effort and creativity was so admirable. I have a photo of me smiling at Pooh Bear on the wall while we were setting it up, but I'm not the most tech savvy to figure out how to link this photo. Anyway, I was in this nursery in my crib, again right next to my dad's room, the perfect age to be on my own. Every night though, my dad was woken up by me screaming and crying. He had raised four children before me, so he was not making first-time parent mistakes that would otherwise be in question. 
He thought it was probably the switch to being in my own room rather than being in his room that caused my nightly discomfort. He considered bringing my crib back into his room, but of course the nursery was all ready to go. I had just graduated to it. For a while when I cried in terror, he would come in and check on me, only to find that nothing was wrong in the sense of present stressors like temperature, diaper change, hunger or thirst, etc. He would stay with me until I fell asleep or keep the light on to make me feel safer and then returned to his room to get some actual rest. One night after finally having enough of my distress, he decided to camp out on the floor of my nursery to see if he could figure out what was the matter, but mostly to try and sleep through the night. This was the last time anyone slept in there. I was able to doze off now that I wasn't alone. He on the other hand, was tossing and turning on the hardwood floor, not comfortable enough to sleep. As he lay there on the floor, mulling over the situation, Boom, boom, boom. He was jolted to his feet by a few massive blows to the floorboards beneath him, centered directly on his back, as if someone on the first floor had a battering ram aimed at the ceiling. His first instinct was to rush downstairs and check for intruders. He is a man of logic, brave and ready to defend his family. However, when he got down there, the lights were off. There was no one downstairs, front door locked, windows locked no sign of forced entry anywhere, and no one else lived with us. Our closest neighbor was down the road a quarter of a mile, and why would they break in just to bang on the ceiling, let alone have it mapped out where my dad would be sleeping in my nursery? And the force of the blows, this wasn't normal. After the event, my dad brought my crib back into his bedroom, and I was able to sleep without screaming or crying beyond needing a diaper change or something normal. He brought the Bible into the nursery for extra measure and casted out any evil that may have invited itself there. He locked up that nursery and only used it for storage after that, and only went in during the daytime. To this day, that old lock is still on the door, as if a lock will keep spirits locked in, maybe with iron. Short of pretending that experience never happened, he couldn't rationalize it enough to do anything else. We think that the entity was evil and malicious. And when my dad tried protecting me, this only pissed it off. As I grew up in that house, I had a hard time sleeping in any room on my own. Many nights I ended up rushing to the couch in the living room, turning on the TV and watching Disney till I fell asleep. But even then I was not comfortable. There were always eyes on me. There were many unexplained events from the farmhouse. But this was the most direct encounter with evil my dad has ever had. Case Notes Bonus 5. Well, I just wanted to say that your dad is a brave man indeed. A true guardian spirit, even though he was still but a man. In many ways that makes it more impressive than someone who had special powers, or was beyond the mortal realm, like an angel. He's the type of father that I hope to be one day. Case File number 236, written by Ink Death. Memory Fibers Woven with Time. When I die, I hope to get this one question answered. Yeah, I would definitely choose this one. When I was in 7th grade, you got to choose music or study hall as one of your classes. Each class block was 45 minutes. I chose music, which was held in the gym across the school. It was a day like any other. I distinctly remember the bell going off, telling me to go to my last class. So, because it was music, I left my backpack in classroom and headed to gym. I remember going down the stairs. Then, I remember going down the stairs again. This time, my backpack was packed and I was heading to the bus. Music class was over, and I had somehow gone and gotten back to my classroom and packed my bag. Except, I didn't go. My whole life I've had missing time, it's something I'm used to. I wasn't scared about it. I didn't think too much about it either. I was a good kid, straight A's. Never missed school or class. When I got to school the next day, my music teacher yelled at me about missing class again. First off, when did I ever miss her class in the first place? And I was there. I had to have been. I launched a whole investigation. None of the teachers or classmates remember seeing me. The nurse, who was at the bottom of the stairs, never saw me come down the stairs. And all the doors are locked from the inside, so you can leave but not get back in. The only way back in is the main entrance, and you have to be let in by the principal or the front desk person, and neither of them saw me. 
So it hypothetically happened to me twice, and to this day, there is nowhere I could have been without being seen. So where the hell was I? And how did I get my backpack? Case file number 237, written by Diacoptes, Misty Vomits. A friend and I went to a buddy's house for a birthday party, stayed up playing Halo 2 and hanging out. We all crash in the basement. Our friend who came with me, and I, got up at the same time. Not like one after the other. We both got up at the exact same time after being asleep for a few hours and rushed to the bathroom. R was more athletic than me, and probably still is, and beat me there. I ran upstairs, barely getting my head over the toilet before puking my guts out. R was doing the same thing in the basement below. I was wearing a wooden cross my grandmother mailed me from Romania. I'm not religious, but I appreciated the gift as I had never met her at that point. The cross somehow became detached from the cord, fell on the tile, and broke into two pieces. So we both call our respective mothers and get picked up. By now it's like 3 or 4 am. I felt sick until we left the house. Once I was in the car and a few blocks away, felt perfectly fine. R reported the same thing to me that day over MSN Messenger. Felt perfectly fine after a few blocks away. Got the pictures developed a few weeks later. There's a picture of us on the couch rocking some halo, and the whole room looks like it's filled with mist. Super spooky. I've been looking for the pic for a long time and I can't seem to find it anymore, but every few years my sister and I search my mom's photo albums for it. Case file number 238, written by Level 100 Gamer, Universe into Universe, from the Lou. I heard lots of stories about when you die, you get sent into an alternate universe where things are more or less the same, except minor details change such as designs are different or maybe even everyday things are different people included. So to get straight to the point, there is a painting in my house which is a black and white tree with all of its leaves on the ground, with branches hanging over a bench. I also have an electric fireplace which is on the main wall. I woke up in the middle of the night to do you know what. The pains were terrible and I remember passing out. I woke up and it was 1.27 am. I remember leaving to go to the toilet at 1.23 am, so that was pretty strange. And when I finished up in the bathroom and walked out, the painting was different. It had leaves on the tree and the leaves from the ground were gone. My fireplace had an extended wall behind it too. I have lived in this house for years so I definitely can tell the difference. I don't really know what to do other than post this. If I tell my family, they'll only laugh at me. Is this a glitch in the matrix? Case Notes, file number 238. While this certainly does appear to be a quick story of quantum immortality, you die in one reality but your consciousness isn't permanently bound to one body. It can move between them even in other universes, or server realms as I like to think of them. It even sounds like something that happened to me when I was a teenager, as I had unfathomable pain in my stomach which suddenly just ended. Although I didn't notice any huge details off if I did cross over myself back then. You did and it was a big detail. A painting changing is not something you can miss or forget, nor is it something that a memory fade could explain like the Mandela effect, remembering things differently from a long time ago. No, this was a painting in your own home. You saw it every day. You can't misremember what it looks like. Case file number 239, written by Rip Psycho, the great cookie imposter. Some backstory, I'm from Birmingham, Alabama but moved to Denver in 2013 with my girlfriend and lived there for about five and a half years until we had our daughter and decided to move home to be closer to family. We would always come home for major holidays while we lived there, since traveling on our own dime across the country as a 19 and 23 year old was kind of expensive. We were back at home visiting for Christmas when we, me, my girlfriend, and three buddies from back home, decided to try a new 24 hour cookie place downtown called Insomnia Cookies. Nice name. When we walked in, the place was packed, the line wrapped around the inside of the room from the register to the front door, and we were basically last in line behind about five other groups of people. I heard the lady behind the counter yell towards our direction, but at me specifically. Hey, you forgot to get your tips the other night when you left early. 
and I didn't respond because obviously she couldn't have been talking to me since I live in Denver, Colorado. She repeated herself again. This time, I responded and apologized because I wasn't the person she was looking for, but jokingly told her I'd take the tips anyways. She looked kind of annoyed and was like, Right, well, if you want them, I can grab them for you. I told her again that I was just kidding, and I really was not this person who she thought she worked with every single day. So after reassuring her, she again, with kind of an attitude, took our order and we were on our way. We all talked about how weird it was on the way back to my girlfriend's mom's house, but chalked it up to just another look-alike story. Well, fast forward to last night, five years later. My girlfriend, who ironically is pregnant again, was craving snickerdoodle cookies from the same place. Around 10 o'clock at night or so, I decided to take the 30-minute trip downtown to grab her favorite cookies. It was Saturday night, so it was like it was last time I went. It was slam-packed to the point where the line ran outside. I finally made it to the front door when I realized I had forgotten my wallet and phone in the car. As I turned around, I frustratingly said out loud, Damn it! And to my surprise, a guy was walking up in an insomnia cookie hat and shirt and said, What's wrong? Did you forget your wallet or something? And I replied, Yeah, my wallet and my freaking phone. And he said, Damn, well run and grab it. I forget, what do you usually get? I was super thrown off by this, so I just said, a half a dozen snickerdoodle cookies? And to my surprise, he was like, Oh yeah, that's right. Go grab your stuff and find me when you get here, and I'll make sure they get you some fresh ones made. And then he went inside. The whole walk back to my truck, and now to the store, I'm like, what the hell is happening right now? I finally made it back, and don't see him, so I just hop back in the long-ass line. After about ten minutes of standing in a non-moving line, he pops his head out looking for me and yells, Yo, bro, what are you doing? I told you to come find me. These cookies are getting cold. And then hands the cookies to me, shakes my hand and tells me it's good to see me, and you'll see me again soon. So again, I'm like, what the bonkers hell is going on right now? He walks around the corner and I take a $20 bill out and walk to the front of the line to the lady at the register. I hold up my $20 and ask, um, how much do I owe for these? And she said, what do you mean? You heard him. You're good to go. I'll see you again soon. I just turned around and walked out, still in shock about who the hell they think I am, but apparently I have a good look-alike or something, good enough to get me someone else's tips and a free half dozen cookies, or is something more afoot. Case file number 240, written by SM127, of death and the stroke of a pen. In college, I took a hard news, soft news journalism class where one of the assignments was to write an obituary for one of my grandparents. The professor told us to write it on a deceased grandparent, but if all of your grandparents were still alive, we had to choose one. In my case, all of my grandparents were alive. I procrastinated actually doing the assignment until the night before it was due because it seemed like a morbid assignment, especially since all of my grandparents were still alive. Scramming for an easy grandparent to write about, I gave my mom a call and asked her for some basic biographical information about my maternal grandfather. As we were talking about my grandpa's career, my mom couldn't recall the name of one of the companies he worked at. She lectured me about waiting until the last minute to write the assignment because it was late, like 10.30pm, my grandpa's time. However, she said that she would give him a call to see if he was still awake and be able to answer that question once my assignment was due the following morning. When my mom called my grandpa, my grandma answered the phone in a panic. My grandma frantically explained that the paramedics had just arrived and were performing CPR on my grandpa because he had stopped breathing and lost consciousness. My mom was able to stay on the phone with my grandma until they took my grandpa to the hospital, where he sadly was declared dead. At the time my mom and I had been talking on the phone about my grandpa's obituary, he was actually dying. His death was entirely unexpected. Although he was in his 80s, he was the healthiest of my grandparents at the time. We ended up using the obituary I wrote for that assignment writing as his actual obituary. Still freaks me out when I think about the timing. Case file number 241, written by Anon 888872. A step through church and time. Alright, so this super weird thing happened to me and my friend the other day. I'm pretty sure it was a time slip, but who knows. So we're walking in Pittsburgh 
a pretty big city, and we rounded a corner to walk to a place I had never seen before. It was a little strip of land in between two industrial slash city looking vibes with a forest and a church. It was a strip of forest that offered a nice relief compared to the big concrete buildings. Anyway, we walked by this pretty church and saw a sign in front of the church that said, celebrating our 80th anniversary. We thought nothing of this, but all of a sudden we both agreed that the atmosphere just felt, for lack of a better word, off. A car drove past us, but it looked really old, and everything around us was super silent. The car didn't make any noise. Whatever, we decided to turn back and start to leave the church. We walked to the staircase to leave the little valley the church was in, where the church was basically out of view. We started walking up the stairs when I saw the anniversary poster in front of the church and had to do a double take. The sign now said, Celebrating our 150th anniversary, and the atmosphere wasn't quiet or eerie anymore. I said to my friend, Did that just change from 80 to 150? And she agreed that she saw the same thing. We went back down the stairs to double check we weren't seeing things incorrectly, but the sign still said 150. Still not really sure what happened or why but it was freaky. Update. I found the church. Okay, forest was a bit of an overstatement, but behind the church they had to not cut down the trees, and compared to the rest of the city, it looked like a forest in my memory. Also, I now have more interesting facts. I looked up the church and it turns out it is 103 years old. I went back to the text I sent the day of the incident and it turns out I got my days wrong in my recollection. I had seen the sign change from 50 to 90. I think this is even weirder, given that it was a 103rd anniversary, not 90. Second, it turns out the school, right by it, Carlo University, is trying to demolish the church. I wonder if this was kind of the spirit or universe of the church crying for help. The church is called St. Agnes Center, and I've attached a text message from that day, and a link to the article that they are tearing down the church. I've lived in Pennsylvania my whole life and I can definitely say I've always believed in spirits and supernatural stuff due to all the weird crap and vibes I've grown up with. Case file number 242, written by Caramel Watermelon. Mum's glitchy powers. Family has a pet bird, Kiki, and for the last several weeks or maybe months, I haven't brought Kiki down to hang out in my room because I don't have a stand for her. She is always in the upstairs room or the porch, and never really down with me in the basement. So finally today, I texted my mom because she wasn't home, if we have any play stands for Kiki, and she says we have the black play stand in the cellar. I look around all over for it, which isn't much to scan over because it's a small area and the play stand is very big. I made sure that it was 100% not there, because I just knew it would be there when my mom came home. I felt like taking a video on my phone and sending it to her as proof. I really wish I had. My mom came downstairs 10 minutes ago and is like, it's right here. And internally I died, but externally I tried playing it off cool. I tried convincing her that it was 100% not there earlier. I believe she thinks I'm going crazy. I go in and out of the cellar part about probably 5 times a day. I'm constantly going in there to get to the freezer, and the play stand is right next to the freezer. So if it was down there all along, that I must have missed it hundreds of times, and also again today before texting her. I had a strong feeling it would just reappear, because that is something that always happens. Searching for something, asking your mom for help to find it, and then it mysteriously appears where you checked prior. But I figured that this wouldn't be the case this time, because the play stand is just so freaking big. Boy was I wrong. To add to this, I've also been seeing big bright white orbs zipping across my room. It has happened about three times in the past two days and I've never had anything like this happen before. Bonus file, written by Hunt Fiona 357 My son, the ghost. There is no other way that I know to say it, because it's just what it is. My son who passed in 2018 has subtly been making his presence known. He has not appeared in spectral form, but he can definitely move things. I've been struggling with my son's death as any mother would. He ended his life at 15 years old. But in recent months, I found enjoyment in soap making, of all things. It's a great distraction. Over the last couple of years, there have been things that have happened that give me no doubt of an afterlife, and I'm in awe and wonder. 
My son's birthday is April 1st. Since his passing, no family member has done anything April Foolsy. It's a solemn day. This year, I went to bed on April 1st, thinking of my son, but I also had soap on my mind. What to make next, am I doing the right thing, etc. When I woke up the next morning, the rest of the household was still sleeping. I then went to the kitchen. The atmosphere felt very peaceful, and I felt the need slash urge to go look at my soaps curing on the racks. When I went into my soap room, lying right in the middle of the floor was a bar of soap. This was just so odd. Who put it there? Why? It had no dents, it didn't fall off the rack, which was in a closet about 5 feet away. My husband, older son and daughter all said they didn't do it, and they were as perplexed as I was. My first thought was that my late son did it. I think he has been easing his way into letting us know that he's still here, in spirit. He's been doing it subtly, so as to not scare us. Previously, my husband one night came to our room and said, Did you see that? I hadn't. He said that the flashlight turned on by itself. This is a very heavy duty flashlight that requires a deep push on the button to turn it on. This was when I thought to myself that my son is trying to make his presence known without terrifying us. My son's father lives with my brother. It wasn't until last month that I went to their house to tell them about this incident. The dad said when he was walking down the stairs a few weeks prior, a dime went rolling past him with nobody else in the area. Then, as I was recounting my story to them, we heard a noise of something falling to the floor from the kitchen table. A flat, square piece of cereal had moved from the table to the floor. I said, See? As if it was something normal but my mind is still numb at all the events. Yay, there is an afterlife, but we know nothing about it until we get there, on natural terms. Case Fa number 243, written by Celestial Slytherin, The Spirit of a Glitch. I, 21 female, was driving down the highway to run some errands in the city. I was alone in my car, listening to the radio. First, I felt the headache and I thought about driving to the rest place to drink some water, but I was in a hurry so I decided to drive straight to the city. I remember passing a billboard and I was completely alone on the highway. I live in Europe, so driving alone on the highway isn't exactly common, but then and there I was alone, no car or truck in sight. I thought it was strange, but I drove for another kilometer or so, I believe, when someone said, Celestial Slytherin, step on the brakes. I turned my head and I saw a girl, similar to me but with a few distinctive differences, and she was basically looking at me like I'm mad, and then she said again something like, Are you deaf? Step on the freaking brakes or grandpa's gonna be super mad. I said something in the lines of, Okay geez, and slammed my brakes, and in that moment I was back on a busy highway, only I wasn't driving because there was an accident, which is why other drivers had to move to create space for first responders. So I found myself sitting in my car and her sighing in relief and laughing and saying something like, don't scare me like that again. And then she disappeared. I realized that I was really close to the rear of the car in front of me and that the man inside was looking at me like I was nuts. So I apologized because as I believe, I almost crashed into him. I was probably in shock, so it didn't occur to me to call my mom or dad. But when I came home, I told her the story and didn't really think much about it. Still don't know why. But she went pale, and I mean pale, pale. She told me that when she was still pregnant with me, she always had a feeling she was carrying twins, especially because twins are really common on my dad's side of the family. My uncles are twins, so is my grandmother. And even though the doctors always said she was only carrying one kid, she always said she felt two. I know that this event wasn't a vision, nor did I just imagine it. I remember it fully, I was fully conscious. I basically just accepted her in my passenger seat. I vividly remember all the differences between us and even the clothes she wore. She also mentioned my already deceased grandfather, who was always very concerned when anyone in our family went on the highway. I have two theories. Either I passed, for a moment, to an alternate universe where I have a twin sister. Or my mom was actually pregnant with twins, but my sister passed very early in the womb, and I somehow absorbed her or something. And please don't make fun of me for not exactly being a medical expert. 
Case file number 244, written by Hyriath O. Oh, Glitch of Nature. We've been living here for four years, and I'm sure this tree was not there before. It's my favorite corner of the backyard, because there's a snake that usually hides in the bush that is in that corner. I go there often to see the snake. That tree was never there. There was just a bush. Today, I went there again. I go there every day. And the bush is there. But a big tree is there too, right next to the bush. I thought my parents somehow bought that tree and planted it there. Although, I found it weird because it's a huge tree. So I asked them how they got the tree, and they looked at me all confused and said, it's always been there. They said it was already there when we moved in. There's absolutely no way. I've been here for four years and there's no way I didn't see this tree. I go there every day. I asked my brothers too and they all told me that the tree was always there. What the hell is going on? Case file number 245, written by Chaos Destroya 01. The Shirt of Universes I spent the last few days, almost a week, at my best friend's place, and the first night I was there, I was wearing one of my band shirts that I really like. She even made a joke about it, so I for sure know that she saw me wearing it. Anyway, later I take it off to sleep because I was getting too hot in the spare room, and when I wake up in the morning, it isn't on top of the desk where I thought I put it. I was like, alright, whatever, I misplace things all the time. It'll crop up later. Over the next few days, I kept looking for it, but I never saw it, nor did she. But here it is. Today I came home from her place, and it's literally folded sitting on top of my bed, along with the spare socks and boxers I brought with me that I also thought I lost. I couldn't even process it for a second, and had to tell my brother about it. Any rational suggestion he brought up never happened. I'm half convinced everything is a simulation at this point. Case file number 246, written by King Nightingale. A trick of the mind on this dark night? I went over to a friend from work's place. I live in Wisconsin, and for the past few days we've had a lot of crazy thunderstorms and rain rolling through. And this night was the craziest it got. The roads were flooded, lightning and thunder constantly crackling in the sky. Driving over had me feeling a little nervous, and normally I never feel worried about how I drive in storms, but it was extra windy and pouring rain. Anyway, I make it to my friend, John's, apartment, and as I get out of my car, there was a deafeningly loud thunderclap overhead, as if Thor himself had just landed in the backyard. I approach the door to the apartment, to which my buddy is already standing at the foot of the dark stairwell leading to his apartment. Our power's out, he tells me. I walk in and go upstairs with him into their apartment. As I enter the room, it's obviously pretty dark, but not pitch black. It was still 8pm around this time, and some light was creeping in from their balcony sliding door. I made note that Patrick, another co-worker who lives with my buddy, was sitting on the couch by this window, along with another silhouette of a person who I assumed was his brother, who had been staying with them for a little while. Both of them turned their heads towards me when I entered, but didn't say anything. I began feeling a nervous panic as I turned to put the beer I had brought over in the fridge. I, for some reason, felt weird energy in the living room around the corner where Patrick and his brother were sitting. John said something like, You can go into the living room, you don't have to hang back here. And I turned the corner, greeted Patrick, and was going to greet his brother, until I noticed the other silhouette I saw was now gone. Now it was just Patrick on the couch. I don't let this freak me out now. I waited a good 15-30 to 30 minutes before saying, Hey, weren't there four of us in here? To which John and Patrick both said, No? I then mentioned that I thought I saw Patrick's brother sitting on the couch next to him, to which Patrick explains his brother left two days ago. So what the hell did I see turn its head to look at me enter? Why was it sitting next to Patrick? Was this just my mind filling in the blanks because I assumed his brother was over, and it was dark enough that my mind put an imaginary person next to Patrick? What happened? Bonus file, written by Dr. Breen. Something followed me home from vacation. I need some help identifying whatever the hell is here with me. I just got back from a week-long vacation last night, and the same activity from the house I was staying in is going on at my apartment. 
I apologize in advance for any incoherence in what I say, because I haven't gotten much sleep last week. The house we stayed in was gorgeous, and since my entire extended family was staying there, 18 people, it was also absolutely massive. It was split into two parts, the old side of the house, roughly just a basement studio and three bedrooms upstairs, and the newer side. I'm not going to go into much detail about the newer side, as no paranormal activity took place there, but it was truly a gorgeous house. I shared a room with my girlfriend, and since we were the last to arrive, we got the worst room in the house. Not only did we get the smallest room in the house, it was about 10 feet by 10 feet, it was also on the old side of the house, directly in front of the basement stairs. As I had been driving for 6 hours that day, I was pretty tired, so I said hello to everyone and quickly got into bed to go to sleep. It was around 11pm when my girlfriend and I got into bed. She's lucky in the sense that she can fall asleep just about anywhere in 5 minutes flat, so she was asleep within seconds. I had a weird, uneasy feeling in my chest. Not necessarily a scary feeling, just that annoying alert feeling you get when you feel like something is watching you. To help ease myself, I hopped right down into a YouTube rabbit hole. About an hour into my journey, I could tell that my girlfriend was having a nightmare, so I put my hand on her arm to gently wake her up, but as soon as I touched her, she bolted awake screaming, mumbled, the ghost, and immediately went back to sleep. I had just started to get tired and, safe to say, I was sufficiently creeped out at this point, so back down the rabbit hole I went. About two hours went by when my girlfriend woke up screaming again, saying, the footsteps are close, and passed out immediately. I then decided I'm not going to sleep that night and went right back to YouTube. Another hour passes and I see my girlfriend sit up in bed, but she's still asleep. She moved so she was sitting on the edge of the bed and started having a conversation with the corner of the room. She eventually laid back down, but not before I was absolutely terrified. Activity dies down after the first night, usually just creaks on the floor or knocks on the wall slash door. The only other standout event besides movement around the room happened on the second to last night when something sat down on the edge of my bed. My first thought was that my cat jumped onto the bed, but I remembered I wasn't at my apartment and sat up just in time to see the indentation lift up off the edge of the bed. It couldn't have been my girlfriend as she was on the opposite side of the bed and nowhere near where the indentation happened. Also, the bed I was staying in was firm as a rock, so it was challenging to push that far down into it. Fast forward one more sleepless night, and I'm on my way home. After a long day of driving, I got back and settled down with some Netflix. My girlfriend had plans to go hang out with her friends, so she was out for most of the night. I thought I'd finally get a break from the spooky stuff when my dog and cat both started tracking something around my apartment. The way their heads were moving, whatever they saw was moving fast. Now I've seen them track bugs before, but neither of them really focus on it too much. They usually just huff and ignore it, but this was different. Poppy, my dog, started growling when whatever it was moved into the corner of the room. My cat Anna jumped up right next to me on the couch while Poppy growled at the corner and started to slowly back up towards me. After a full week of crap like this, I wasn't even scared anymore. Just pissed off and tired because it likes to keep me from falling asleep, whatever it is. Poppy and Anna both tracked the thing moving out of the corner towards us, so she starts barking like crazy. After I got her to stop barking, I heard a growl come from the center of the room. It was pretty high pitched, like a small dog or a girl. Judging by where my pets were tracking, it looked like it was very short, very fast, and could jump up on the table and counters. I stood up, stared in its general direction and said, please leave. I got a huge wave of chills and goosebumps, in places I didn't even know I could get goosebumps, but I said it again, much louder and more stern this time, while opening my front door to let it out. Please leave. Whatever it was got really upset, it didn't do anything but I could feel a lot of anger. My pets tracked it moving towards a door, so I thought I was in the clear. About two minutes later, my dog starts barking at the corner of the room where the door is, while my cat is on full alert, staring at the same place. At this point, I just give up and hope it just leaves me alone, since it hasn't been violent yet, just annoying. Poppy eventually fell asleep at my feet, and Anna had run into the other room, occasionally poking her head out of the door to look in and immediately spring back into the room. 
I just gave up on dealing with it at this point. I put my earbuds in to block out the knocks on the walls and watch some YouTube. I decided to stay up until my girlfriend got back to let her know what was happening, but whatever it was took this as an opportunity to mess with me. I was laying on my couch and kept feeling something poking me every five minutes. Not hard, just constant pokes on my arms and legs and feet. After this went on for a while, it pulled up on my nostrils. Again, I just ignored it because I learned it gets worse if I engage with it. Whenever something like this would happen, I could feel the apartment get much colder, despite my thermostat saying it was 72 degrees. After hours of knocking, poking, pulling, and the occasional arm brush, my girlfriend finally got home. The second she got through the door, I could tell that whatever it was, had left, as I had no uneasy feeling and there were no more weird noises, so I had one of the most restful nights I've had in over a week. I don't know if it's gone for good or if it will come back tonight. Other than the growl and the short but overwhelming sense of anger, it hasn't been violent or disturbing, just really annoying. Any help on how to identify or safely communicate with it would be greatly appreciated. Edit. It has only been a couple of hours since I posted this, but activity has been a little higher since. For starters, I am running a fever out of the blue. My temp was 98.8 this morning. I checked because I had a fever the previous night, and it has risen again to 101.3 in only 15 minutes. On top of this, the knocking and rustling noises around the apartment have started up again. I feel absolutely drained. It's even hard to keep my eyes open despite a good night's rest yesterday. The main point of this post is for advice and help on how to deal with this thing. Thank you to anyone who can help. Update. Luckily, there has been no new activity since a couple of nights ago. Not even an unsettling feeling. My girlfriend and I have been home pretty much consistently the past day, and things seem to only pick up when I'm alone in the apartment. Normally I wouldn't be worried, but I have to take the next couple of days off of work and my girlfriend is leaving for a beach trip for the next couple of days so I will be alone. More updates to come. Case file number 247, written by From a Dur to Kungur. The sands of time fall slower in Moscow. I am a French language teacher in Russia, an expat, and due to that, I should travel at least once a year to Moscow for documents. Embassy bureaucracy, what can you do? And because I live in a city that's 2,000 kilometers far from Moscow, I use the planes each and every time. Well now, let's jump to the fun part. The time zone in Moscow is a two hour difference. I flew to Moscow with my wife and landed safely. I went to the embassy at 9am and did my things and by 10am I was already finished. Now we have the whole day to visit Moscow before our flight back, which will be at 11pm. First we visited Lenin Library, Undergrounds, Kremlin Gardens, the Cathedral, the Red Square, by foot. And when I looked at the time, I was shocked. It's 11 a.m. which means this whole excursion took one hour. And I was so sure it took more because for those who don't know, Moscow is a gigantic city and we moved between places by foot. No taxi, no bus, just by foot. I thought that maybe it's just because of the time zone difference and I felt a little tired after the flight. But no, my watch and phone were automatically updated when we got to Moscow. So we decided to find a place to eat and we were looking around here and there. Then we found a good spot. We settled down and had lunch, took a tour around the mall and commercial centers, bought souvenirs, took coffee and just a few cigarettes. Then I took a look at my phone. What the hell? It's 11.30 a.m. Just 30 minutes gone by? My wife noticed it too and we felt a little weird. We're already tired walking around places and time is literally not moving or moving slowly. I suggested to sit at an open air cafe and just waste some time until 7 p.m. to go back to the airport. We sat down and took my fifth or sixth coffee that day. I talked to my wife about anything and everything. Time goes and felt that we minimum sat there for two hours. But no, it was only 12, another 30 minutes. I practically lost it. And to not make the text long and boring, we kept moving between cafes and museums on this infinite day. And finally, when 7pm hit, I said for God's sake, finally. It really felt like forever, and when I checked my phone's step counter, it was 400% more than my expected number. We walked around 15 kilometers around the city center, and then I understood that something was unusual about that trip, because when I got back to my city, the time was running like usual. I could feel how the time was going faster than in Moscow. 
What do you think? Case file number 248, written by MaxPot46. Let's play Extra Dimensional Portal Ball. I've never had any kind of paranormal or UFO experience that I know of, but I have experienced one extremely jarring glitch in the Matrix. I was in my apartment and bouncing a blue racquetball off the floor super hard so that I would bounce up to the ceiling and back down to the floor. I was just playing a silly game where I was trying to get it to bounce back and forth as many times as possible. The ceiling was a flat, white painted ceiling with literally no fixtures of any kind on it. On one of the bounces, the ball hit the floor, bounced up to the ceiling, and sank right into it, disappearing. Right before my very eyes. I was seriously shocked. I thought that maybe I'd blacked out for a second or something. But I looked around immediately on the floor and didn't see the ball anywhere, which should have been easy because it still had a ton of kinetic force in it and should have been still bouncing or rolling. I tore the area apart looking, but I couldn't find the ball. Then, about 30 minutes later, my wife got home, and when she opened the door to our apartment, I saw the ball fall out of the ceiling behind her in the hallway. I immediately ran out there, and yep, there it was, just bouncing and rolling down the hall like it had fallen out of the ceiling about 20 yards away from where I saw it disappear. I remember this extremely vividly, both the sensory visual experience of seeing it disappear into the ceiling and the emotional shock I was experiencing in that moment, as well as when it reappeared out in the hall. It's what got me to start seriously considering simulation theory, and now I'm fairly convinced that we're living in one. Case Notes, file number 248. <laughs> well, this is my jam, Mr. Maxpot. Two balls lost in my life, although none came back. I'm not going crazy nor are you, I think. What the hell is right, right? Why balls too? It seems like the most common object to disappear are balls and socks. Your account though is very unique in the ball somehow merging with other matter. Almost like it phased through the ceiling, then it bounced around in the interiors of the ceiling towards the door entrance. When your wife came home, it sort of phased back through the ceiling and then fell down. I wonder if this is a glimpse behind the scenes for disappearing object phenomena. A matter phasing glitch? Case file number 249, written by McKay of Spades. Husband out of place at night. Every night I go to bed about two hours before my husband. I always wake up when he comes into the room. One night he was gaming with a friend and it was hours later. I heard him sneak into the room and crawl across the floor so he could pop up and scare me. I felt the floor kind of shake and felt him bump clumsily against the side of the bed in the dark. I held out my hand and asked him not to scare me. I was already scared enough and begged him to just take my hand and come to bed. I couldn't see anything in the room, but knew he was there and just waited for him to jump up so I could move on and go back to sleep. That's when I heard him talking to his friend in the other room. I was frozen. I know there's sleep paralysis or lucid dreaming or something that explains this. But I would have sworn on my son's life that someone had crawled across the floor and jolted the bed. Eventually I worked out the fear enough to grab my phone and text my husband to come in and turn on the lights and check under the bed. But holy crap, it boggles me how real it felt. Bonus file, written by Dr. Breen. According to my sleepwalking girlfriend, there are men moving under the bed. This is a continuation from the first part. While the last couple of days were pretty silent, last night was terrible. I had that unsettling feeling for most of the night before we went to bed, so I knew something was going to happen. When we were in bed, before we went to sleep, my girlfriend joked around that she was possessed by a demon and kept making this really creepy grin, like the one where you're smiling ear to ear, but your eyes are wide open. I could tell she was joking, but still a little creepy. After that, she told me the ghost in her dream said I was cheating on her. I definitely am not. We've been dating for three years and I would never do that to her, so apparently this ghost is a homewrecker. While that's not necessarily creepy, just annoying that a ghost is trying to break us up, things picked up when she went to sleep. It started with this loud booming sound, sort of like a big truck driving by your window with the rhythmic beat of the engine. At first, that's what I thought it was. The window in our bedroom is right over the street, where it's not rare for a big truck to drive by. 
but this booming never stopped. There wasn't a single point where this noise was coming from. No matter where I looked, the volume of the boom never changed. Throughout the entire night, it never stopped, never got louder, never changed rhythm, just kept beating and beating and beating. Normally, I would easily be able to write this off and just fall asleep, but about 30 minutes after my girlfriend fell asleep, she started talking again. At first, she looked like she was having a pleasant conversation. She held out her hand for what looked like a handshake and started giggling. After that, I could hear her bring up my name in the incoherence of her sleep, so I thought, maybe she's talking to me in her dream. Nope. After a little more of the conversation went on, she looked at me with her eyes open and said, we're talking about you, and started giggling and then passed right back out. This creeped me out a lot, reminding me of the first night at the lake house. After such a spook, there was only one thing I could do, fall deep into a YouTube rabbit hole. I put my AirPods in. I could still hear the booming, but a little more muffled now, and pulled up a video. About another half hour goes by and my girlfriend is talking again. This conversation seems a little more serious as she's not giggling and her tone changed. After about a minute of talking, she sits up in bed and does just about the worst thing I could imagine. She crawls over to my side of the bed, crouches down on the floor, points under the bed, looks directly in my eyes and says, there's men moving around under there. She just got back into bed and fell asleep like nothing happened. About an inch away from needing to change my pajama pants, I shake her awake and say, What did you mean by that? She looked really confused and said she had no clue what I was talking about. I said, Please tell me you're joking. You don't remember a thing? You just pointed under the bed and said there are men moving under there. She immediately looks terrified and says, I have no clue what you're talking about. Quit scaring me. It took a bit longer for her to fall asleep after that, and I turned my phone flashlight on for the remainder of the night. Not much happened after that. There was another point where she held her hand out for a handshake and mumbled something, but no conversation that time. She left at about 7.30am this morning, but after saying goodbye, I immediately got back in bed and passed out. When I woke up again around 10.30, I felt this completely overwhelming sadness that had me on the verge of tears. Even in that moment when you first wake up and you can't remember a single thing about your day, I still felt that sadness. Of course, I love and miss my girlfriend with all of my heart, but she was only going to be gone for a couple of days, and even when we would take separate trips, neither of us would get this world-ending feeling. It genuinely felt like the world had gone grey and the only thing I could do was cry. Luckily, I was able to push through this feeling and take my dog out to potty. Not even 30 seconds of being outside and the feeling was completely gone. Again, I miss my girlfriend a lot and still feel that but not to the point of mental breakdown. It seems like activity is picking up again, and the men moving under the bed definitely seem to miss my girlfriend too, seeing as they're already trying to break us up, and now I'm alone in the apartment with them, and I'm pretty terrified. I might go get some sage to smudge the apartment later today. Case file number 250, written by Anastasio Pimpinila, Earth and Stone. Timeline Evidence Basically, since 2018, I've been checking this very specific location on Google Maps and Apple Maps with satellite images from time to time, for a reason I won't get into here. I would check this small village that was, as I remember, 7 to 10 kilometers east of a big city and was connected through a big road, not a highway. It remained ever since, until after around September 2020, when I decided to recheck the same position but found out things were extremely different. This village was now 15 to 20 kilometers northeast of the city and was only connected through a highway which was not there before. However, that is not what shocked me. It was a huge quarry that appeared right next to it all of a sudden. This quarry was huge, 4 kilometers wide, and I was surprised by its existence as it was not previously there and would take years for it to be dug out. So I decided to investigate. I went to Apple Maps and Bing Maps to see the satellite images and sure enough, there was the same quarry in their photos. I downloaded Google Earth and saw the historical satellite images of the area. The quarry had been there since at least the 1980s. I contacted some local businesses on Instagram to ask them about the quarry and they all told me it had been there for at least 150 years. 
It could not be a bug, as it would have to affect Google Maps and Apple Maps at the same time, in the same timestamp. It was not carbon monoxide poisoning, as I don't have any such gas in my home. It was not drugs, as I never did drugs before. I went to a therapist, and she told me I was mentally healthy, and it could not have been any sort of mental illness that would cause this. After September 2020, things seemed different. The query was just an indication of things not being right. My friends behaved differently. My brother, internet communities that I had been a part of for a long time, seemed off. The world has never been the same after that month. I cannot prove that I changed timelines, as I do not have any photos or paintings of the village before it changed, but I am sure, 100%, that the quarry was not there. You just have to take my word for it, I guess. Case file number 251, written by Big SHIT, Transdimensional Plumbing. Way back in year 10, I'm from the UK, so I'm not sure what that equates to in American school years. I had biology class. In this class, the seats were laid out so there were five rows facing the teacher's desk at the front, all parallel with the front wall, and then one small desk along a side wall, parallel with that side wall, so that the people sat there and had to turn 90 degrees to see the teacher's desk. Me and a friend both sat here on the side desk all year. And all year, we would look up at the ceiling of the class and it would be the same, nothing on the ceiling except the lights and the fire alarm. It was painted white, so anything on the ceiling would have been very distinctive. Anyway, about one month until the end of the year, I turn around on my seat one day and find that all of a sudden, there is a pipe slash pillar going up in the center of the room and then branching out in two opposite directions at the ceiling to span the entire length of the room along the roof. This pipe was like a rusty brown black and had pictures of cells hanging from it that looked like something a year seven would make. I turned and asked my friend besides me how long that had been there. He too had never seen it in his life. And yet the people sitting in the rows, the ones sitting right next to this pillar that went right in front of their desks, were now all kind of sitting on the side of it, so it didn't block their view. And no one seemed confused about it being there. We asked our other two friends to sit at the same desk, and they were very confused by us. They say it's always been there and that everyone has always had to sit there like that to see the front. Only me and my friend are adamant that there is no way in hell that this brown pipe has been on this white ceiling this whole time. It's literally impossible to miss. It came out of nowhere one day, and only two of us seem to be outside of its tricks. Very odd, but I still remember it to this day. Bonus file, written by Dr. Breen. His cat has evidence of the supernatural. This is a continuation the third part of something following me home from vacation. Not too much has happened since my previous post, until last night. My girlfriend went to visit her family, but I stayed behind to work because we're broke college students. For some reason, every time my girlfriend leaves the apartment, the activity picks up to a whole new level. It started once the sun started to set, an uneasy feeling that I wasn't alone. Slight things kept happening before the sun completely set, like the occasional knock on the wall or a cold spot. Which was weird because my AC is broken and the temp was 76 Fahrenheit, 24.5 C, in my apartment. I was sitting on my couch, which is positioned right next to the door to my balcony. The bottom of the door has this layering underneath to protect it from heavy rain getting under the door, and it makes a pretty loud scraping sound whenever the door moves. Every five minutes or so, I would hear the door get tugged or pushed in its frame. At this point, I already know what's coming once it gets dark out, so I mentally prepare for the night ahead. Just as expected, activity increased dramatically as soon as the sun set. The first sign was the poking. The cold spots were getting more and more frequent, and some were accompanied by tugs on my shirt, pokes on my legs and chest, and the occasional brush on my arm. I was too tired to really do much about it, so I just chilled out through this until my cat, who was previously napping in the bedroom, came into the living room. As soon as she walked out, she looked straight into the corner of the room next to the couch and got immediately into defense mode. All the hairs on her back stood up, and she started growling and hissing at what seemed to be nothing but air. Now my cat is as sweet as can be, and the only time she ever meows or growls is when my dog is chasing her around the apartment, and she feels threatened. I've never seen her go on the attack before, as she usually just turns tail and hides whenever she feels threatened. That's why, when she made a full sprint charge at the corner and started trying to claw through the wall, I was a bit surprised. 
Just a couple seconds later, I heard what can only be described as a cat screaming, and then she bolted back into the bedroom to hide. She did this a few times, coming out, growling, charging at the wall, and running away screaming before she came up with a new strategy. Throughout this, I think she noticed I was just chilling and eventually she gave up on the attack. She laid down on a chair that was towards the middle of the room and started tracking it. Whatever it was could move fast, and it wasn't limited to the ground. At this point, I was seeing little orbs of light or flashes flying around the room. Most happened in the corner of my eyes, but I saw a few head on. All the orbs of light were very small and would move at a short distance before disappearing. Now, it was about 1am at this point, so it could have been from potential hallucinations due to being tired, but the previous few nights I got 7 hours of sleep or more, so I wasn't super sleep deprived or anything. After a particularly loud bang on the wall near my head, I decided enough was enough and I had to leave for a bit. Previously, I told it to leave, but I never saw orbs of light or bangs this loud and definitely didn't want to piss it off. I took a quick midnight Taco Bell trip to wash my fears away with a Baja Blast, giving me time to calm myself down before going back in. Walking back in the room felt like the meme from the community where Troy brings a pizza into the burning apartment. My cat sprints over to me at the door and immediately goes to attack the thing. Apparently it was under the table next to the couch, while I saw three orbs fly through the air within just a few seconds of me walking back in. Seeing as whatever it was was just playing with my cat and hadn't hurt me so far, I just walked back into the couch with my Taco Bell and started playing some games on my laptop as a distraction. After a couple more minutes, I remembered I wanted proof. This was when I decided to start filming. My cat had retreated back to her chair and was just tracking this thing everywhere. It appears that there are a few times it runs right over to me. Almost every time that happened, I would instantly feel colder. About 10 minutes after the last video was taken, I became incredibly tired out of the blue. I could barely keep my eyes open and almost fell asleep on the couch a few times before I decided it would be best to go to my room away from whatever this was. As soon as I sat up to get off the couch, there was a huge bang on the glass table next to me. I was too tired to care at all, and I knew this spooky fella was all bark, but no bite, so I went to my room anyway. My cat followed quickly and acted as my personal bodyguard. She sat on my chest and would start pawing at the air if whatever it was got too close. After a short while, I somehow fell asleep. It's now the next morning and my girlfriend is debating on staying at her family's house a little longer, as her best childhood friend is visiting their hometown in a couple days as well. If that's just night one, then I'm not sure I'm ready for what else is to come, but there will definitely be more updates to come if anything else happens. Oh, I almost forgot to mention, something that happened right before I fell asleep. I was falling asleep to a podcast with my Bluetooth earbuds in. Out of the blue, my AirPods made this noise they do whenever a device connects to them, and my podcast stopped playing. To be able to connect to my earbuds, you have to hold down a button on the back of the case which was sitting on my bedside table. Also, I know it didn't just randomly disconnect, as the connection noise is different from the disconnect noise. I quickly went into Bluetooth settings and reconnected, but I'm curious as to what happened and what I would have heard had I not disconnected. Case file number 252, written by Beep Beep 85 A butt and a sneeze, crafty glitch. I was leaving a doctor's appointment, and was stopped at a red light in my car at an intersection. I sneezed. About 10 seconds later, my iPhone that was securely in the pocket on the thigh part of my yoga pants started ringing. It was my mom and I answered it. Immediately she said, bless you. I froze and started looking around, thinking that by some coincidence she had seen me. That was the only logical explanation. But she lives 20 plus miles away from where my appointment was, so that was highly unlikely. I said, what did you say? Thinking that maybe I imagined it, and she responded, didn't you just sneeze? I told her that I had, but it was several seconds before she called and my phone was locked in my pocket. She swears she absolutely heard me sneeze and I believe her because how could she have known? I didn't have an outgoing call to her, so it wasn't a pocket dial. I have no logical explanation. She heard me sneeze from miles away and 10 seconds after it actually happened. We've always been close and have had weird occurrences like an eye twitch at the same time. 
and experiencing random heart palpitations that went on for some time before one of us brought it up and realized it was happening to both of us. But never anything like this that we absolutely could not explain or just attribute to coincidence. Anyone have any insight on what could have taken place? A glitch in the matrix? Weird telepathic occurrence? Case file number 253, written by Individual Act 5804, Prom Dress Perfectionist. I graduated high school in 2001. When I was in high school, I loved thrifting and sewing. I had my own sewing machine and would buy things at thrift stores and alter them to fit me. I am very petite, 5 feet tall and 115 pounds, so finding things to fit off the rack is always difficult. In the winter of my senior year, I found this beautiful, vintage floor-length dress. It is black with magenta flowers all over it. It was a halter dress with a very deep V in the front. When I saw this dress, I thought, this is my prom dress. I bought it and brought it home. The deep V in the front was a bit too revealing for me, and the dress was about 5 inches too long, so I decided to do an alteration even though prom was months and months away. I hemmed the bottom of the dress and with the extra fabric I sewed a triangle into the deep V to make it less revealing. I tried it on and was very happy with the look. I put it away to save it for prom since it was still several months away. Cut to prom season. I went to pull the dress from the bin it was stored in. It was polyester, so no wrinkles. And instead of the alteration I made to the deep V, there are perfectly sewn ruffles along the deep V along with ties to hold the V closed. The dress was still altered by me to fit my height, but the other alteration was not the same. I don't know how to sew ruffles like that. The dress was stored in a bin. I asked my sister and mom and they both swore they did not alter the dress. They don't sew anyway. I tried the dress on and the ruffles and the tie looked amazing, so I wore it just like that, but I still have no idea what the heck happened to my original alteration. Case file number 254, written by Weeping Willows 123 Smelly Green Water My sister and I went kayaking, and usually when we go, we both bring reusable water bottles for hydration. My water bottle is a foot tall, from a well-known brand, and is stainless steel. Our kayaking place is this community recreation area, and we rent from one of the huts that is there. There are at least a dozen teens working on the hut and managing the rentals, and on average about 50 people on the dock at a time. We got into our kayak and enjoyed the water for a few hours. We both took sips of water and stored it in a drawstring backpack. Once we were done, we returned the kayak and started walking away from the hut, except I realized my water bottle was missing. My sister opened the bag and only her water bottle was inside. This is a cheap Walmart drawstring bag with no extra pockets. She took her water bottle out and flipped it upside down. Nothing. So we begin searching. We check the dock the kayak we just returned, and the hut. Asked the workers, asked other people. I was quite upset because I really loved this bottle and a new one would be pricey. It was not possible for it to have fallen in the water since I took a sip after we both got out of the kayak and thought I stored it in the bag. We concluded someone must have taken it. We got home and both of our parents checked the bag. Nothing. We used the bag twice more later in the week and it was not there. Two months later, I go to grab this bag from the closet, and my water bottle is inside, with smelly green water, and a piece of patterned duct tape stuck to the edge. We don't own patterned duct tape. My whole family still does not have a single explanation to this day. Bonus file, written by Michi Ru 957 John was right, his home was haunted. Way back in 8th grade, I had a friend, John, who years before had his house burned and deemed unlivable. Now being a kid, full of confidence and not fully believing it, me and another friend Jim called BS at the time when my friend said the burned house was haunted. Finally one day, John agrees and we go see this house as his family still had the keys and it was on his way home. Walking up to the place, John had told us about several experiences in the house, from a large Civil War looking soldier to energy balls and children's laughter that would appear and disappear. Taking this information, we still called BS and went inside the house. The inside of the house was still fine, as it was the garage that had burned, making it a hazard, but safe enough to explore. The inside of the house felt strange, zero airflow, but no dust, and at first, dead silence. After walking in and essentially walking straight to the garage entrance and the back door, 
to show the fire marks and point out where John had found arrowheads in his backyard. We decided to look around more. Very soon after we started walking towards their old rooms, we all very faintly heard music. The strangest part is each of us heard entirely different genres. Rock, classical, and rap. We reached John's sister's old room, and it was barren of course, and the windows were covered but nothing weird. Then the same with John's old room. Between the two of them, most of the apparitions had started and then gone and disappeared into John's parents' room. Logically, that was our next and final stop of the tour. Confused by indescribable music and getting nervous, we reached John's parents' room and tried the door. It felt sealed, like when something heavy is against it or a vacuum is applying pressure. However, the house was sealed and we were supposedly the first ones inside in a long time. With a good shove, we managed it open and got the biggest gust of stale, dead, musty air I've ever had. Freaked out by the sudden gust that smelled like death had once been there, we took off. Halfway crossing the street, Jim called out, Hey guys, look at the house! Nervously, all three of us turned and saw a huge apparition, easily six foot plus and solid fridge build, in the window. Solid looking, but you had to stare and squint hard to start to get the edges of details. And it was watching us, staring us down from the inside. Obviously freaked out, we ran all the way to John's current house. And that's the story of my first haunting slash paranormal experience way back in 8th grade. Bonus file. Written by Toffee Smithy, what her stepdaughter confirmed sent chills up her spine. I live in a three-story, four-bedroom new-build house. This plot of land was a residential home. Before that, I have no idea. Anyway, myself, my partner, and our young children have lived here since it was built, nearly six years. I've never felt anything bad or good in this house, except for the bedroom on the top floor. That bedroom was our youngest one's bedroom. That was her bedroom from about six months until about two years. She never slept well, ever. She would always wake up during the night, sometimes crying uncontrollably. We just put it down to her being a crap sleeper. However, sometimes if we couldn't settle her back down, we'd bring her into our room, which was directly next to said room. She would just sit and stare into the hallway outside and would refuse to be put down near the doorway. And if we tried to carry her out into the hallway to show her nothing was there, she would freak out. She no longer has that room as her bedroom. She shares with her older sisters now. The middle child, boy, now has that bedroom. He claims to feel fine there. However, when it was our youngest's bedroom, when she'd wake in the night, my partner would go downstairs to make her a bottle and I would go in to comfort her while comforting her with my back to the door. I would always feel like there was something or someone watching me, so I would feel forced to glance back over my shoulder. That's the backstory. Now, during a conversation we were having as a family tonight, myself and my partner were talking to the eldest child, 15 years old, and she just so happened to sleep in her brother's room last night. He was at a sleepover at a friend's house, and she wanted to escape the two younger ones. Anyway, we asked her how she slept. Totally normal question, and we certainly didn't lead her to an answer. She said, Ah, uh, you know, not so great. I felt on edge, like someone was watching me from the doorway. I wasn't scared, but I felt anxious. How she described her feelings was exactly how I felt in the past when I would often be in there comforting our youngest. Neither my partner nor myself have ever spoken to the children about this, so there's no way she was just regurgitating what we've said. I felt a shiver go up my spine when my stepdaughter said this tonight, because it was so accurate. My partner immediately looked at me, as if to say, Wow, that's exactly what we've said. I just wanted to share my story and to see if anybody can relate. A friend has just recommended we invest in some selenite to place around the room. Does anyone else have any other suggestions? Case file number 255, written by Mark. A picture drawn, faded from existence. I'm an artist. Back when I was living with my parents, one particular evening when they got home, my dad said that a guy he works with was starting a barbecue business and wanted me to create a picture for the business. I worked several days on it and the end result was a picture of a pig holding a barbecue fork and wearing an apron. I felt good about it and looked forward to it being used and seen by the public. One night at supper, I asked my dad, 
Hey, how are things going with the restaurant business? He didn't know what I was talking about. I told him the whole situation, and he still didn't know about it. I went to my art table and looked for the picture, but it wasn't there. The whole situation never happened, but I know I created that picture. Bonus file, written by Pokemon Yo. Special artifact, and a paranormal history. A family member bought this object at an antique store. She looked at it and walked about 20 feet away from it, then was drawn back to the object, looked at it closer. It was a great piece, and decided to buy it. After bringing it home today, it sat in the garage for a few hours. Later on, she went outside to clean it and wash it out, and brought it inside the home, into a room near the kitchen, then left the object there on the table. She took several photos of the object on the table, then immediately went into the kitchen to clean the dishes. While cleaning the dishes, she felt an intense force rushing up on her to grab her. She felt the actual pressure on her left side from the disembodied voice coming up on her, and heard something make a sound in her left ear. She said she can't remember the exact sound, but when she originally told me it was almost like a negative, uh, it wasn't a high-pitched yell or anything, like a medium-range sound. It made her jump, letting out a shrieking sound. It was an intense, immediate feeling of panic when it happened, she said. The feeling went away only after telling any negative spirits and energies to leave, and that they were not welcome here, saying it out loud several times in the garage and inside the house, while placing a Bible on the object and holding a cross. At first, when it happened, she thought someone else was playing a trick on her in the house. The feeling of a male figure, she actually thought it was her husband coming up on her to mess with her, but there was no one around. The closest person was in the bathroom quite a distance away, and another person was on a separate floor of the house. After hearing the shrieking slash yelling sound she made, the family member in the bathroom quickly came into the kitchen and asked what just happened. It all happened very quickly, around 5.40pm local time. This is not the first time an object has been purchased, bought, brought home, and very strange things start happening. For example, an antique wood clock that was purchased in another state. It was a clock that would hang on the wall and had a very solid latch that would keep it closed. We would come down several times in the morning and the clock would be completely open as if someone moved it over the latch and opened it up. Sometimes the TV would even be turned on to different screens in that same room. But no one messed with the clock and no one turned on the TV. You would even hear people yelling out your name as if someone was calling for you but no one was actually calling for you. After getting rid of that clock, those issues basically completely stopped. Today's example was the most negative feeling of all the paranormal experiences in this house. But again, things felt much better after telling it to leave and that it's not welcome here, whatever it is. The other experiences did not feel negative, maybe playful or trickster-like, but nothing negative. However, the name calling out has somewhat persisted or continued on, but is still very infrequent, off and on. While writing this story, there were several electronic glitches where I wasn't able to write it out. Notepad would scroll up by itself and not let me copy the text I wrote. This long block of text kept deleting itself in real time while I was watching the screen, so I had to copy and paste it to a new note. And while trying to save the images, it froze my computer. Maybe it has nothing to do with it and is just a software issue, but who knows. The object has been donated to Goodwill now, sent text to four different people after donated it. The images disappeared or showed up blank, not able to view it. Update. I've always believed in the paranormal, but many years ago I made it a goal of mine to actively seek out and experience it for myself, firsthand. One summer, my friends and I spent a lot of time traveling to various spots known to be very haunted across the St. Louis, Missouri region. One night, we took the Ouija board to Main Street in St. Charles, Missouri, a city founded in 1969. It was the first state capital of Missouri, and it's situated on the Missouri River. Using it there for several hours, some strange things happened while using the Ouija board. Very old perfume smells, some movement and responses on the Ouija board with the planchette, and gusts of wind, but nothing really paranormal until we were getting ready to leave. Prior to leaving, we were talking and standing by our cars, and directly across the street from me, I saw a tall woman in white, frantically running across the street in an 1800 eras dress. She was transparent, bright, white, and quickly vanished. If I blinked my eyes, I would have missed her. That's how fast she ran and vanished. 
I looked at my friend and said, Did you just see? And he basically said, That lady in a white dress that ran across the street? Yeah. He validated what I saw without even having to say it. There are several stories of the lady in white in St. Charles that can be found online. According to the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, the lady in white reportedly haunts the 400 block of South Main Street in St. Charles, sulking behind the buildings where no one ventures after dusk. The 400 block of St. Main Street is the exact location where we saw her, literally on the dot. We all left Main Street, it was like 3 a.m., and drove over to the St. Charles Borromeo Catholic Cemetery. My friend parked his car. I rode with him, and as a group with our other friends, who separately drove their own cars, we all walked into the cemetery to try to experience more and hopefully catch some evidence. Eventually, a cop pulled up in his car, then walked up and asked us what we were doing. We told him we were ghost hunting. He was super cool about it and said, I have something to show you, come with me, and took us over to Jean-Baptiste Point du Sable's grave and explained who he was, the founder of Chicago. Along with some of the stories and how the area is known to be super haunted, Louis Blanchet, the founder of the city St. Charles, is buried there too. We spent a few minutes more there, then afterwards, we went back to the car my friend parked. His mileage was at 666. This experience led me and that same friend spending a lot of time in his house conducting EVPs, basically using multiple voice recorders to capture audio, taking pictures and recording video, using an MEL meter, EMF meters, PSB7 spirit box, and a REM pod. Along with consistently using the Ouija board and conducting seances asking for things to happen, to show themselves to us, etc. We were very dedicated and serious about it. There's too many things we experience at this house to list. Here are some of the experiences. This is a list of three separate EVP sessions we had that took place in the same room of this house. First session. We were sitting in his room, during an EVP session recording the audio, asking for the entity to make a noise, show itself to us, etc. All of a sudden, his tall lamp fell over in the corner. We were sitting away from it, no one touched it. My friend ran out of the room, I jumped over the bed and clipped my leg on it, even having to get a bandage for it. We went back and listened to the audio, and a voice appeared on the recording. Visually looking at the audio, we could see a blip. It was at a much lower frequency slash volume than our voices. We could hear the response but decided to increase the volume of the audio. The voice said, Wait. Wait. Just before the lamp fell over, it was telling us it was about to do something prior to doing it, sort of like a countdown. For example, Wait. Wait. Okay, now. Second session. As we listened back to this recording session, there was a voice that specifically said my friend's name, then my name. We quickly went downstairs and told his older brother. I exported the audio and emailed it to his brother. His brother opened it up and played the audio file out loud on his TV from a different room. The recording said my friend's name, then my name, like it originally did when we played it back. The brother played the audio over and over again, but this time it also included the brother's name in the recording. His brother's eyes immediately teared up. He was visibly shaken, and told us to get out of his room. I'm not sure how this is even possible. I mentioned the electronic glitches in the last post, but it was a scary moment that an audio file already exported from one device and shared to a different device could be altered in real time as we listened to it together. Third session. We received an intelligent response to a direct question we asked. We asked how old the entity was, and he specifically responded to us with his age. 18. Again, looking at the audio, there was a small blip where the entity responded, and it was on a much lower frequency slash volume than our voices. Item slash objects moving and disappearing was a somewhat common occurrence in his home, and even in my home. A couple examples here. In my friend's house, while we were watching something on TV, there was a coin that fell off his dresser in his room. It caught our attention, so we went looking for it. When we found it a few minutes later, it was in a closed dresser drawer. At my house, my friend was not with me. While I was sitting in a room near the kitchen, yes, the same kitchen from my last post, which is also the same home as a clock opening by itself and TV turning on, I heard a dish break out of nowhere. I went into the kitchen and noticed that for the dish to have broken, 
it would have needed to be lifted up from the dish rack, since there's sides and walls around the edge of it, moved over like two feet and then dropped directly into the sink. There was nothing in the sink before it happened, dishes were already cleaned. If it simply fell into the sink, which it couldn't have, it would have landed on the left side of the sink, but instead it was on the right side. We continued to actively seek paranormal experiences and ask for entities to show themselves, even though we already 100% believed in it and had those prior experiences, we wanted more and more, which led to the most profound experience I've ever had. It was approaching midnight on a snowy and icy winter night, in December. My friend and I were driving back to my place and as we came up to a crossroads, road intersection, less than a quarter of a mile ahead of us, we noticed a man in dark dirty clothes carrying a dirty bag over his shoulder, resembling a very old man, and he had a limp. As he walked, it was kind of glitchy looking and didn't look normal at all. He was walking along the side of the road towards the crossroads, with his back to us as we approached him. Immediately my friend and I thought it was unordinary. We looked at each other and said, what the fuck? As we've always traveled this road many, many times and never saw someone walking on it, especially during winter and at midnight. Our first thought is, it could be a homeless man. I seriously considered rolling down the window and asking if he was okay, but that thought quickly changed as we approached him. As we were passing alongside him, I looked over my shoulder directly looking at his face. Nothingness. It was pitch black. Then I looked at his hands and they were also pitch black too, and not like he was wearing a ski mask and gloves. Additionally, he was not transparent, like most apparitions are. He actually completely resembled a human in appearance and apparel, except for the face and hands. My friend and I quickly drove to the other side of the crossroad and immediately whipped the car around to get another view of him. Then he was already gone. Then hundreds of feet back, where we just came from, we saw an entity cross the road and then vanish under a light post. So we drove down the road and back multiple times, no one to be found anywhere. When we decided to finally go back home, we had to turn around in a court and a big black dog was on the side of the road and stared at us as we drove by. Then a few minutes later, a rabbit runs right out in front of us, causing us to frantically slam on the brakes. This experience occurred at a crossroads near a Catholic church. A few days later, we decided to visit the church and see if they had any familiarity with such stories or sightings. No one answered the door, although several cars were there. Then we visited a second Catholic church in the area, and as we were walking up through the grass towards one of the buildings, a black cat walked up besides my friend and I, stared at us, then continued walking on. Guess what? This church did not answer their door for us either. I want to mention, I don't believe in the black cat superstition, and felt zero negative or evil energy from the cat. The cat was awesome and just looked at us before moving onward. All of this still gives me goosebumps today and it happened many years back. For a while now, I've been looking for more clarity, explanation, and to better understand all of it. We sought it out and found it, but there aren't many answers. What's your take on all these experiences? What do you think it means? And most importantly, who was the entity we saw at the crossroads and what would have caused them to appear to us that night? No one else was around the entire time it happened. Not one car, one person, nothing. Case file number 256, written by Anonymous, my unknown friend. I was at a gathering in this famous themed restaurant, and I met all my friends there, after so long due to the current world event. But here's the thing, I also met this man who claimed to be my oldest friend and that we met regularly. Firstly, I have no male friends because I went to an all-girls school. Secondly, I have like three friends. I think I would remember a fourth one who I apparently meet regularly. Most of my friends were like, yeah, don't you remember him? I thought these idiots were pranking me, so I dismissed it. But then this dude starts talking about my life at present and assuring me that everything will be okay. Mind you, this is a personal incident, I've talked to no one about it. This freaks me out and I go home, saying that I'm feeling a bit nauseous and just rummage through my things hoping to find this man anywhere. Nope. And then I get a text. This man sends me a photo with my identity card from back in 2017, saying crap like, whoops, someone has a bad memory. Now this short-circuited my brain. Pretty sure he was never my friend. 
but how the hell did he get my identity card? Case file number 257, written by Kibu Fox. A couple echoing through space-time. Now with almost all these glitches, it's one person noticing something and it makes them go, hmm, that's odd. This, however, didn't happen to just one person. It happened to two people, myself and a friend. So some short backstory, really simple stuff. I needed coffee creamer and some other stuff from the store. Friend decided to walk over with me, taking a break from the mind-numbingly hard game he'd been playing. All good. We crossed the street and were walking up towards the store when something curious happened. I don't know what about these people stood out to us, but we stepped aside to let a man and a woman pass us. They turned and went into this apartment building besides us. The woman stopped for a moment, bending over to pick up something she dropped before she headed inside. Friend and I shared a glance and even said, that felt odd for some reason, with him noting that he thought he knew them but couldn't really place it. We then continued our walk. The path to the store is about a block, give or take. We tend to walk pretty quickly, which will be relevant later. It took us maybe five minutes, talking and walking, to get to the next street corner. That's where the strangeness started, well above and beyond the weird feeling about the pair. As we reached the other side, that same man and woman seemed to practically appear from nowhere, off to our right, and turn to cross the road. By appearance, I mean one second they weren't there, the next they were. My friend and I stopped, looking at each other, and then watched them walk down the sidewalk. We then watched as just like before, the woman dropped something, bent over and picked it up and headed inside. Every motion is the exact same from the first time we intersected them, in their path. We tried rationalizing it, but couldn't really come up with anything. For example, they didn't come out and run past us to the store. To go around the block the other way wouldn't have allowed them to be on the same road, in front of us. They didn't step out of a car, and they didn't take a bus just to repeat their walk. It was, in short, like they were stuck in some sort of time loop, or we were outside of time for that moment. Try as I might, I cannot come up with a reasonable explanation of this incident. Case file number 258, written by Sawmill Turtle. I have a brother who couldn't possibly have been born. Well, this glitch certainly overlaps with my childhood. But a lot of this account deals with events that have unfolded over the last couple of years, which involve supposed events from my childhood that didn't happen. These events, as you will see, were not things that I would be able to remember incorrectly. And even if that weren't the case, my own sister remembers things the same way I do. Also, I will be changing the names of involved parties, like my siblings. These are names that they'd recognize, but no one else will, for privacy and all that, you understand. 2019. My mother died of an unexpected heart attack in her bedroom while living with my sister in Virginia. It was tragic and devastated all of us. She was all we had in the world other than each other. As my sister Rose said a year after her passing, we're all alone now. After she died, the process of going through her things began. My sister Lindy thankfully handled all of that, as well as the process of mom's cremation. She's an incredibly strong person. When mom's phone was turned on and accessed, there was someone listed within that no one knew. We'll call him Beard, for lack of anything more creative coming to mind. Who was this person? The messages seemed to indicate that he was none other than a son that mom had given up for adoption in 1994. Say what? 1994. According to Beard, mom was secretly taken by a relative to the hospital, where she gave birth to him and immediately gave him up for a better life. He was adopted straight away, and no mention was ever made of him. No one even knew he existed until, well, until we went through mom's phone. Here's the problem with this. I would have remembered her being pregnant. I was just shy of 12 years old when he was born. My birthday was only days away. I was old enough by that point to understand the birds and the bees, and signs of pregnancy, considering that I had four younger siblings by that point, and had seen her pregnant multiple times. There are certain things that would have stuck out to me. It's not a simple matter of wearing baggy clothes to hide a protruding belly. Pregnant women have tells, like the way they'll carefully ease their way into a sitting position, or the way they'll often lovingly caress their bellies in spite of themselves. There's also the swelling bosoms, and the water retention, all of it. Somehow I overlooked all of this? And my sister Lindy, who otherwise has no memory of mom being pregnant at this time, 
also overlooked it? I'm telling you this never happened. But it did. My mother gave birth to a son in 1994, somehow without any of us being the wiser, and shipped him off. How? 1995. My mother gives birth to my sister Rose and keeps her, even though we were even less financially secure at this point than we were previously. Why keep one and surrender the other? 2021, or earlier this week. Two years now since mom died, and a year since I was told about Beard by my sister Rose. Beard has added several family members on Facebook, so Facebook keeps suggesting him to me as people you may know. No, I'm not interested. Suggested again, not interested. Again, over and over and over again. Finally, I grew tired of avoiding the subject. This whole thing reeks of horse manure, but I work it out in my head like so. If this man is a con man, why would he pick my mother of all people? My mother was nobody to everyone but the people who loved her. She was not a celebrity, former or current. She was not a YouTuber. She did not run a blog. She did not make appearances on the local news for anything. She kept a normal, completely low profile because she was rather private. She was also broke. So if he's running a scam, why pick her? She has nothing to give. Even if he was a con man trying to con someone with nothing, she's been dead for two years. He either believes his own con, is playing the long game for some bizarre reason, or he's the real deal. I took a page from Sherlock Holmes and eliminated everything else, and the conclusion that I came to is that he's the real deal. The most convincing piece of evidence is my own mother. She never dismissed him or told him he was mistaken. She acknowledged it. There's no way someone would simply be mistaken about carrying a child for nine months and then giving it up. That's not a, wow, I don't remember doing that kind of situation. So I talked with him. This brother I never had before, who never existed. He said he used ancestry to trace his origins, and that's how he found us. We spoke on the phone for three hours, and I sincerely believe him to the point that I call him my brother now. But the problem here is the same. It's the pregnancy that never happened that couldn't have happened, that no one ever saw. That would have been almost impossible to hide. Give birth in secret? Sure, I guess. His provided day of birth was a Monday, so I was in school. Okay, but the nine months that preceded it? I'm to believe that none of us, not one of us, saw anything? No, 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 no. I was speaking with my uncle about his own son the day before last, and I told him that the boy is only six years old. But even he would know a pregnant woman if he saw one. He wouldn't be able to tell you how the baby got there, but he'd be able to say, that woman has a baby in her tummy. So when I was almost 12, I was, what, more oblivious than a six-year-old? That's nice. No, this never happened. Except we've got some weird Mandela effect or glitch in the Matrix event, and now it did. Now I have a brother who didn't exist before and couldn't have. Instead of considering our clan as six in number, now we consider it seven. Seven. I mean, it really boggles the mind. Conclusion. Some of you may be incredulous. Some of you may dismiss this as a mistake or simply say that my mom was especially good at hiding things. That's fine. If I could get every single person to believe every single word that I say, no matter what it is, I'd have a better success rate than Jesus. Even he couldn't do that. So I expect some disbelief. All I can say is that, to those of us in the family, those of us who were around her every day of our childhoods and a large portion of our adult lives, this could not have happened. Welcome to the family, Beard. I don't know how you came to be one of us, but you are. Regardless of everything else, you are one of us. Bonus file, written by throwaway4737391. Supernatural Forces in New Mexico. When I was a kid, I lived with my grandma for a while, and her house was an extremely weird place. The house was dome-shaped and had some very absurd architectural designs. A 15-foot deep hole in the backyard, a staircase leading down to nowhere, the house flooding for no reason. The whole place just had a surreal vibe. This house was right outside the Najavo Reservation in a very isolated part of New Mexico, though we did have two neighbors who built ranches up there recently. Super rich old people. My grandma's place was built sometime in the 19th century. According to my grandma, it was originally built to treat tuberculosis patients when TB was really bad in New Mexico. I was pretty young, but I'll never forget what I saw up there. The shower had a small round window that looked into the living room, 
I thought that was cool as I would wave to my grandma while showering, but I quickly became afraid of it. One day, me and my grandma were playing cards in the living room, and a large handprint appeared on the shower window. I pointed to it, and this freaked out even my grandma who promptly got up and saged the place. This couldn't have been my handprint as I was a little kid and this handprint was huge and lanky. My second experience. The house had an upstairs level, but it only covered half the ceiling. Think of an indoor balcony. This is where me and my grandma would sleep as the bathroom was their only actual room in the house. One night, I had a dream that an invisible force had picked me up and thrown me off the upstairs level, which is a big fear of mine. I woke up before I hit the ground and guess where I was? Laying on the first floor, underneath the edge of the upstairs level. It would have been a pretty big fall, but I had no pain. Another experience. I was out in the backyard playing, and our swings started swinging very fast and violently. There was no wind, and my grandma's horses became extremely spooked before this even started happening, and were trying to escape their pen. I had countless other paranormal experiences here, but these were the ones that stood out to me.